everyone and welcome back. It is Championship Saturday here for the Mac Conference. My name is Soy. Joining me for one last ride is Kilo Miles, and we are getting ready for Grand Finals between Quinnipiac and Siena. And I mean, Soy, who else could it be? Who else has put on these dominant performances running through the likes of me Maris? Manhattan, Iona, Canisius, Ryder, I mean, everyone fell, even Niagara, they all fall in the end, and it's seeds, one and two. Maris, I think, maybe gave them the biggest run for their money, and even they could not stand up to these two titans, this rematch from the last match. A rematch from the last Mac, indeed. These two teams, in their entirety of the EGF, they've met six times before this, and four of those wins have gone Sienna's way. They have been the defending champs for the past two seasons. We'll see if Quinnipiac can upset that today, but one more look at the rules here. You get two points for winning each of your sets, and a point for every stock remaining at the end of each game we'll keep track of that as this goes on this is another case where if a match gets out of reach for either team the set is done over and dusted and we will be going to the awards ceremony after that but the way these two teams have been playing i doubt that to be the case when these two teams meet it is always a close battle and speaking of to start the day looks like we'll be getting those players locked in grit versus waffle to kick off grand finals and now this is going to be interesting because we talked about yesterday how Grit was kind of playing that rush down, that Bowser Jr. You can't really rush down Sonic, not in the way you like. It's very different. You have to almost intercept the momentum. You have to attack where they're going to be, not where they are. And that's always true, but it's especially true with Sonic. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. Grand Finals is underway in Atlantic City. There can only be one victor. Game one on PS2. Where else would you rather be? Waffle on this Sonic. Grit on the Bowser Jr. As we mentioned, and things relatively even off of the start here. And these two have been very good this weekend overall. Grit, one of the key players for Quinnipiac. Undefeated, as we mentioned numerous times throughout the regular season and he won against King Gelato in that Niagara set along yesterday against Phantom Man. Waffle, we've only seen him once this weekend, but he's looked very strong so far. Yeah, I mean, the fact that Grit has come out against some of the heaviest hitters like Phantom Man and come out on top, that's something you've got to keep an eye on. As they've got reaction times like that, just setting out a jab to interrupt the spin dash, planking with it, and then hitting you with a barrage. Now, trying to get back to ledge, using that lingering option to interrupt anything that Waffle wants to throw out. Right now, it's Grit, who's dictating the pace of this game. That side B secures the kill, and Grit already working on this second stock, but Waffle, if there's one thing he's been able to do very well in sets like these, it's answered back quickly. He's got a lot of work to do, though, but you're seeing already a quick 40, make, make that 50%, and the back air to get him off stage. Grit has to recover low here. Good job avoiding the spring and the forward smash, and nearly found a forward smash of his own, but Grit trying to turn this one around. 54 to Waffle's name as he makes it back to the stage, and both of these to just able to track each other down so well. Yeah, I mean, look at this. They keep getting hit by these little dash attacks, but at this point, not a lot is going to confirm into the kill except maybe that spin dash forward air, and yet Grit refuses to give it to them, and without that, it's up to Waffle to find a hard read to finish them off. Finally, though, reading that air dodge away with that forward air, that's going to be Waffle getting their first stock on the board. You were talking about hard reads. How about the read on that air dodge to secure that first stock? A crazy one at that, but 72 to Waffle's name here. Still a lot of work to be done, but if there's one character that can get a lot of work done, it's Sonic. These combos already up to 53. The forward air so well spaced, and now these two just trading back and forth. It's Grit trying to get out of disadvantage for now. And he's still kind of kept to the outer rings of this stage. 
Oh. And now you can see, as the percent's even up, I was going to say it's looking even, but catching that recovery with that forward smash when you weren't even facing the right way to start out, that's awareness right there from Grit, as now the starter comes out again. Can you finish him off? No! Oh, that time you will, though. What a forward smash from Waffle. Both players catching him on the recovery in the last stocks there. So, last stock here in game number one. An ever important victory on the line here for both of these schools. The upbeat doesn't connect afterward, and that's a chance missed for the side of Quinnipiac. Now, Grit trying to find his footing once more. He's landed a couple of these down airs to try and kind of reset the scenario. The, the multi-hit of the forward smash hit, but it wasn't enough. Now the up smash connects, and this is getting dangerous for both players now. Well, you can see Grit was ready on that movement, and they were ready to cover the other direction if the clown car sent that way, but they can't quite get these confirms, and now you're getting into the range. Maybe Waffle, but no! You can't outrun a clown car, my friend, and the dashback is caught. The DI goes straight out because of it, and that'll be Grit putting the first point on the board of the Grand Finals. Great catch there, as you said, Grit, that side B, catching the dash back, and, you know, as you pointed out, that DI suspect because of that dash back, so really great stuff to Grit there to take that first point, and you can tell from the players on stage, there's some, there's some high emotions, they both know what is on the line here, these two have gone back and forth so many times, these are arguably the best iterations of these rosters in the past three seasons, so they're feeling the pressure of that spotlight, game number two about to get underway, no character swaps involved, but the stage is going to be town and city. Now these smaller side blast zones, I think are going to benefit, uh, waffle a lot more spin dash forward air spin dash back air they're gonna hit so much quicker and that is well that's bad but as we've seen these forward smashes at ledge if one of those catches at such a low percent it might just mean death this upper platform saving waffle a lot here another option that you know, Grit has to try and cover, and it's buying Waffle that extra second of time, but the side B right now, between the battle of the side Bs, that cart is just winning out right now. And it's stuffing Waffle time and time again, but there's that spin dash into the forward air to get even more percent on the board, and now the situation is reversed. That ledge guard, oh, what a catch! Waffle gets him off stage, spin dash will be able to cover much with that, and Grit will make it back, but both playing dangerously now, just short of 100% each. Edge guard attempt number two, and he won't be able to find that forward smash. Actually, Clanks, and there's the forwarder once more to get Grit off stage. The catch Ooh. on the two frame, but he got his cart back. The up B, he'll be able to get back in time, and the forward air saves his life. The up air won't take the stock quite yet. Grit surviving here at 150 until the back air lands. Yeah, these disjoints getting off ledge have been tough, but it still doesn't change the fact that Waffle is betting the edge. But even if you have the edge in the neutral interactions, the fact that they're so consistent catching your ledge options with that forward smash. Ooh, that was close. In the second either of these players goes off stage, it feels like it could be disastrous because they both been able to punish each other so hard for not being able to cleanly snap to the ledge. Right now on the second stock, things are still at low percents, but it is Grit at the percent deficit. These trades are not working out in his favor either. Waffle right now in control so far, playing around these platforms so well, but Grit is trying to buy himself some space, but Waffle just not allowing it. Back throw to get him off stage once more. That neutral B will buy him a little bit of time, but there's the forward smash. Good air. He still manages to grab the ledge. Oh, perfect movement right there with that air dodge. I was scared you weren't going to grab the ledge at all, but now you're able to be back in center stage, pressuring with these explosions and catching the wand landing. Now, you go for that a disjointed forward air, forward smash again, but they can't quite land it. Waffle is being so elusive right now, but that landing is caught by the forward smash and off the corner. Right now, grid up a stock to one. 
what a huge forward smash and 141 on grit and he's working on waffles last stock here follows him on the spring but ends up eating the up air i like the idea going a little bit risky with it but that up air not gonna seal the deal quite yet he's at 178 right now any sort of grab should do it but grabbing grit is not gonna be easy as he avoids that forward smash 39 to waffles name here in the Full hits of the forward air, still won't do it, but that back air will once again taking the stock. We're down to last stocks here. I mean, can you blame them for not being able to find this grab? How often are they in the air? They're dropping bombs on you. It's a raid as you're able to get so much damage by just dropping down these cars and getting a follow-up. But right now, this could be it. But going past them, drifting behind with the wand, finishing off Waffle right there with a clunk to the back of the head. That'll be great. Putting the first points on the board for Quinnipiac. And look at that. You can tell they are hyped up after that win. That was a close one, a nail biter, but Grit came out on top. And that one, especially in game number two, Waffle had the lead through, I'd say, the first half of that game, but the conversions, the second Grit got that forward smash to take that second stock, you could tell the momentum immediately switched on a dime. And now it is Quinnipiac putting four points on the board. It looks like they'll be sending in Billy Shilly next as their next contestant. He was the player last year in that MAC championship that went up against Knight. And he got shut down in that final set that allowed Sienna to get the championship. And I'm sure he remembers that and is looking for redemption here. And all weekend long, Billy Shilly been wearing the moniker Do It Cool, and that's exactly what they've been doing. Time and time again, they have put on a show on this Pokemon trainer, stringing people along through combo after combo into precise edge guards. I mean, we've seen them miss down air edge guards like 50% of the time, but if you're hitting every other time that they're grabbing the ledge, how many kills are you getting right there? <laughs> A, a lot is the answer. The other thing I remember about Billy Shilly's playstyle, especially on this Pokemon trainer, he is not afraid to pull the trigger early on a lot of those special attacks. Think Ivysaur up B. Think, uh, think about the Charizard side Bs from Ledge as well. He is not afraid to go for those quick kill moves just to test and see if your DI is ready at those kind of mid-high percents just to see if he can get an early kill. And that can be very dangerous. But speaking of dangerous, his counterpart for set number two, Pango. He has been a menace. I love what you said the first day. It feels like he plays in creative mode. He has so many intricate setups to try and get you off guard. He's very read heavy, and this is going to be another pivotal moment for both of these players. Yeah, this, I mean, it all comes down to this right here. If they go up two unanswered sets, then Quinnipiac, they might just run away with the entire finals. You would need miracle plays from every player. You need to keep it close right here, and that's what Pango is shooting for. I mean, I feel like you do have the tools to box out Pokemon Trainer most of the time. However, the fact that Pokemon Trainer can get very early stocks with pretty much all of the characters, that's something you've got to keep an eye out. You've got to be always mixing up those recoveries, never getting predictable. Because we did see Pango get called out in recovery occasionally by Maris. Game number two, or sorry, set number two, game number one, PS2, the site of it. Billy Shilly on that Pokemon trainer and Pango on the Steve that they've been rocking all weekend long, all season long here. Right now, things relatively even. That flood, interestingly used there to try and stuff out that cart for a little bit. Curious to see if that's what he continues to do. There's the early upbeat, just to get an, a little bit of extra percent onto Pango. That Nair also going to do some work here. This Squirtle, we didn't see a lot of it, Oof. but it was getting a lot of work done until Oof. this combo here from Pango. Oh, and Pango, that's worrying. They waited for that switch. And even though they didn't get the punish, they still were aware that it was going to happen. If that happens again, if they're able to get a hard read on that switch, then we could be seeing some early stocks right here. But there's an early stock. Speaking of early stocks, the upbeat again from the Ivysaur. Pull the trigger, and now Pango has to find a way down. 8-2 up airs for it, 31%, but... Oh my goodness, that down air does so much shield pressure. Billy Shilly 
Remaining aggressive though against Pango here, trying to not give him all much all that much time in the first place. But the wall has been set up, allowing Pango to kind of farm here some materials, and that back air will land to get Billy Shilly off stage once more. Still only gold on docket here, but the down smash will connect, and that'll be stock number one of Billy Shilly off the board. Yeah, Pango's spacing around that up because they know they love to go from that on the ledge. And with these diamond tools, that one two-hit exchange is already even the percents. More than even. As did you see that? They went for a charged F smash on the ground. It's not that punishable, and if it hit, that was just a kill on Billy Shilly. Pango right now, they're feeling themselves, waiting for their opportunity. Billy Shilly looking to take that away by breaking away their defenses. Saibi stuffed out the cart. Both playing dangerously here. Billy Shilly, though, is the one under pressure at 99% here. I like what Billy Shilly has kind of tried to uh, do in terms of counterplay towards this wall. He's worked away at the bottom block, making it not that easy for the cart to come through. But the back air will come through in the end, and it will seal the stock against that Charizard. So Billy Shilly, he's on his last leg here of game number one. That side B called out just by a little bit of block movement as now we're seeing this block movement come out a lot more. This is what confused a lot of people last time. They're creating their own terrain that you do not know how to play around and you can see it's getting Pango so many hits in neutral. Just time to farm away there and wouldn't quite get through cleanly. 103 make that 109 early up he doesn't land. Tech the block though. What a great tech there from Billy Shilly, but he's still trying to find a way to take this stock off the board. 137 to Pango's name, the back air won't land, neither will the grab, the dash back forward smash nearly finds the stock. He'll switch to Charizard here, heavy body, early trigger on the side B, gets the stock, and it's back to even in terms of the stock count, but 106 to Billy Shilly's name. This is a lot of damage, and it's not going to be enough. No, he survives the forward smash there. He's at 134, but how does he get back? The TNT setup won't work, back throw. Wanted the down air, couldn't find the nair as well, but the up he lands and it won't be enough. The back air will just be it. And that is game one going to Pango. You hauled it. Billy Shilly's so eager to go for those, uh, well, early attempts at kills with the B button, with the up B on Ivysaur, with the side B on Charizard, and it got them a lot of kills. But in the end, they went for it all right there. And that's exactly what you need to go for. Normally, I call out players on overcommitting off stage, but I don't think that was an overcommitment at all. That was the exact swing, the exact momentum shift that you needed. And even though Billy Shilly didn't hit it, it was still admirable that they went for it. That's the kind of thing you need if you're going to bring this back against Pango. Pango, on the other hand, looking to put more points on the board for Sienna, which is desperately needed right now. Quick 45 off of that combo. Squirtle kind of got mitigated after that first stock in game number one. Trying to get something done here, but they're already up to 83. Feel like we're going to see a switch to Ivysaur here at any second. That shield very low. Now there's the switch, but the back air comes through, and Pango's barely been touched this stock. Only 5% to his name. And he's still got time to farm up here. Heart won't land, but the Nair, Ivy Scroll will. Billy Shilly has him up high, but Pango's been able to land fairly safely. Always threatening that anvil. Holds the down smash for so long, but won't be able to find its mark. Getting more percent on the board here is Billy Shilly, and I like what we're seeing. This Ivy Store is putting in a lot of work here, but that up smash, a little ambitious, has to be careful because that forward smash is going to come out, and now Diamond is in the pocket of Pango. I mean, they're baiting a lot of these options, but Pango never overcommits on the punish. They always do it in a little bit of an unorthodox way that gets them out of the end lag so soon. And oh, you're lucky for that weapon break, my friend, because now you're barely able to get off ledge. 62% from one ledge interaction. Going back to Squirtle at ledge, because you know there's no forward smash on deck. You're able to survive that little hit. What a roll around the grab there. And I like these tether cancels that we've seen from Billy Shilly. But we've often seen him try and get back to stage via Charizard. That up smash nearly finding a way to take the stock off of Ivysaur. So there's the switch back to Charizard. Won't find the grab. No tools, but the up smash connects on the high body of Charizard. There's the early side B and the punish is there. That's the stock. It's three to one in Pango's favor. 
Tango, if you're able to get a restock right here, imagine the momentum swing for Sienna after losing game one and out of these strings. 55% going for the minecart read, the up the end of the stage. Each of these could set up into a combo of their own, into a confirm of their own. But Billy Shilly not looking to be deterred. One chance in an edge guard right here, but they missed the down air. Now you gotta lay at the ledge trap, but the lingering hitbox isn't enough. And now you've gotta get back to stage, my friend. Oh, and using the momentum, the end lag cancel. He finds a way to survive though, but maybe not for that one. And it's a three stock from Pango in game number two. And Sienna jump into the lead. Literally jump into the lead right there. That was Pango victorious. That is exactly what Sienna University needed. And oh, they got it. Pango coming in as the clutch player against Billy Shilly. That is what you need to be seeing. On this new character, they have been putting on a show. I don't think you can call Steve a new character anymore, but it's new since the last time they faced off in the MAC Championships presented by EGF in the Showboat Hotel. Pango putting on a clinic there, getting the three stock over Billy Shilly in game number two. With that, Sienna jump into the lead, but we still have three more sets to play. The way these two teams are going, this is going to be a nail biter. It's worth noting, the last time these two teams met, it was Quinnipiac who got the better of Sienna in the regular season, 20 to seven, the only player to take a set in that best or in those five sets in week 11 was pango and he believe i believe yes he beat mr purple in that very first game everyone else well it was it all came up in quinnipiac's favor also interestingly to note we know both of these players have a shulk main that has been prolifically good knight and bako have been spectacular all season long but when they played against each other in week 11, Bako opted not to play Shulk. He instead opted to play Marth. If that ditto comes up again, curious to see if he makes that same decision. That being said, the players have been locked in, it looks like. Soul Cake is going to be going in for the side of Quinnipiac. And for Sienna, it is Bivers. So some rushdown fast characters in a fast-paced match here for set number three. Uh is Soulcake wearing Sonic shoes? Man, Soulcake bringing out the drip. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, listen. It's what you gotta be doing. You gotta get yourself in the mindset any way you can. As, as we're looking to see this ditto, Bivers in general has been looking more and more dominant. I remember in the first game, I was like, I was a little bit scared of Bivers' execution, and then they woke up. And now I'm terrified of Bivers' execution. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, I agree because Bivers, oh. it felt like game number one for him started a little rough, but maybe he was just getting acclimated to the scene. But since then, like you said, that execution has been on point. This Falco has been terrifying, and I think it goes to Bivers' playstyle of being adaptive. We'll have to see if Soul Cake can adapt on this Sonic here. Set number three between these two is underway here, actually. I believe this is a button check, uh, so yeah. it's about to get underway, but still. Sonic versus Falco. Sonics are typically known for being able to control the pace, but I feel like that laser from Falco is going to do a lot of work here for Bivens. Yeah, I mean, you can't throw out the laser too much because that means Sonic is just going to short hop over and get a huge punish on you. However, it's important to throw it out a lot in order to make sure you, you know, put a wall in their face. Make sure they can never be too comfortable in choosing when the engagement starts. It's like, hey, you might be able to choose, but I have a lot of say in where we fight. <laughs> Certainly that agency going to be... Uh, of note here between these two players in this particular matchup. Again, Sienna, they have the lead thanks to that three stock that Pango just got. We'll see if Quinnipiac can respond. We've only seen uh, Soul Cake once this tournament, and he lost to Red Saw the last time we saw him way back in that Niagara matchup. We'll have to see if he is warmed up and ready for the task. Bivers has been on point since taking the stage, and we are underway now in set number three. Yeah, and one thing that's very important about this is 
neutral base characters, I'll say it, don't usually do that well against Sonic because you need to have a good punish game. So when you hit Sonic, you get your money's worth. And there you can see 30% minimum. I'd say that's pretty much well your money's worth, but you want more than that if you're going to take out a player who still plays Caliber. Things relatively, well, I was going to say relatively even, but it is Bivers with the decent percent lead. But that being said, Bivers is off stage. Here's the edge guard attempt. Hard slide angle there from Bivers, but he does make it back. And now the turnaround here. Soul Kick is off stage. Drag down to the forward air, but not all the hits connect. There's the up tilt into the back air, sending him the opposite way. And now it is Soul Cake at 115 right now. Trying to find his footing here. Ends up air dodging, and he will just back away, trying to find his opening off of the spin net. Finds the back air, 60-ish percent to Bivers' name at the moment, but you see Bivers be able to connect time and time again. There's the up tilt into the up air, and that's stock number one off the board of Soul King. And Bivers, every single time last time, was playing against a character who had a lot of ways to get out of those up tilt confirms, like Yoshi. They're not going to be seeing that as much here against Sonic. Sonic, if you get hit by that up tilt at the confirm percent, you would just die. So you've got to be careful about shore hopping around around this Falco. Right now, Soul Cake is the one trying to find his way back. He went for the forward smash read, but doesn't find it. Went for a second one, still can't find the landing. It's Bivers, able to make it back here at 77. Relatively light, but the parry won't get punished there. And now it's Bivers in control of stage, but only for a moment. Soul Cake still trying to find a way to take this first stock, but the combo game of Bivers, very strong. There's that up smash that we saw a lot yesterday. Take a couple of stocks, but Sir Soul Cake able to survive off the back of it. He'll get the grab on shield here. The up throw won't be able to do it. Neither will the up air, but the forward air follow through. And the forward smash at the ledge gets the stock. Yeah, when you're that far away in the spacing, there's not a lot... Dude, that wasn't even a true frame. You just interrupted the side B right there. But if you get interrupt, reverse interrupting this momentum like the laser, like you said, you need to be throwing that out as much as you can when it's safe. Because if you do it when it's unsafe, you're going to get punished. But that drop through Black Form Bear is going to finish off Soul Cake. Two to one right now. And these stocks were practically untouched until that combo. Now Bivers working away, chipping away at this Soul Cake stock here in game number one. 50% to his name. And there's the punish on that over usage of laser, but can't get too much off of it. Off stage here, he'll end up air dodging back. And Soul Cake, oh sorry, Bivers wants the down air. Still wants it, finds it, but he won't get enough. Not enough percent there to fully seal away that stock here. Soul Cake though. Playing dangerously, trying to find a way back. Aggressive forward air gets punished again by the grab. Stops through the laser. Up smash won't connect. And Bivers hunting for a way. Just waiting for those overextensions from Soul Cake. Continuing to work away at the stock. Soul Cake at 112 right now. Has to find his footing, but that up air trades. And Bivers, it feels like it's only a matter of time here until that lands. And the up air connects off the side B. And that's a two stock in game number one. Had enough already? Kanepiak having their points doubled right now versus Sienna. I mean, Sienna, they're starting to run away with this time and time again. It feels like Sienna is coming out on top, and you've got to be aware that it, it just feels like the confirms are what is getting them. We talked about how the up smash in previous sets was uh, Bivers' main tool for getting these confirms. This time, it is up tilt into aerial as we're hearing a swap coming out. Sounds like they're locking it in. Is this the first appearance of land for Banjo and Kazooie? This could be an interesting one between these two. I'm curious to see here if this is the case. It is, and on Lilat too. Soul Cake, we have not seen him play this character all season long. He's bringing out the big guns Woo! here, and he gets the down smash, but the side B, it doesn't connect. Those side Bs in limited usage there, only two feathers there remaining, but he gets the grab, down throw, doesn't find the up tilt off of it, but he will find the 
forward smash to seal away that stock. Only 3% to his name. This, this banjo, it's putting in work. And now, 50% off of one interaction. Bivers is looking to bring this back immediately, but they get called out with a spike of their own, and there, they're just barely able to survive, grabbing onto ledge and the patience right there. I was gonna call it out last game, I just didn't have time with how Bivers was playing. Bivers' patience and waiting for their punishes has been the name of the game for how they're getting so much of these interactions going in their favor. That up smash, not gonna take the stock quite yet. The back air or the up air won't be able to do it either. And Soul Cake will find a way back to stage. A vital game for Quinnipiac here is like you said, their points have been doubled, but certainly not out of reach. And Soul Cake trying to find this edge guard once again. Rivers, back now throw, the back throw right here, no point, side yeah. bees. No side bees at all available. You've got to be wary, but they're going to get through just fine. And now another opportunity to ledge trap. Almost a full stock lead right here for Knipiac. The forward air from Bivers catching Soul Cake just in time. And now he's already going to work on this second stop. Quick 44. And Soul Cake forced it back away. But the Saibi covers the ledge. He ran out of an invincibility. And that's the second stock of Bivers taken away. That might be why we've gone to Lilac. This little bit of interaction right here could just be the name of the game as Soul Cake. Ooh. Get pressured by their own egg grenade thanks to that reflector. I assume that's why we've not seen that thrown out that much. Very easily punished by Falcos. The jump is called out with the forward air, and that is an even game right here. Okay, kick already mm -hmm. burned one side B on this last stock, so only four remaining. 10% to Bivers' name, and he'll be able to take the lead here off of that quick combo. That's two side Bs used, but the damage starting to rack up here. He's gotta be careful, playing around center stage so well, but the side B, no punish. There's the down smash, Bivers is off stage. That forward smash, not gonna do it quite yet. The turnaround's not gonna happen. Two side Bs remaining there for the side of Quinnipiac. The grabs will whip, but there's the Nair. Down throw, no follow up on that quick up tilt. The mash out from Bivers, crazy strong. Only one side B, there it is. And now those get out of jail free cards are gone. Bivers has advantage now gonna land that neutral air where does he go from here not only kick is able to make it back not only do they have advantage but they're pressing it right now i mean soul kick is getting more aggressive to make up for the lack of side b's but now you're off stage and bivers feels perfectly comfortable going off there and because they're so comfortable they're answered by a forward air and you get on Ooh, the up air frame trapping them after that air dodge is waiting, mixing up the DI right here. Another chance at an edge guard with no side B's available. The Nair, is that it? Bivers will close out the stock right there against Soul Cake, a 2-0. And Sienna starting to run away with this point total. Another huge performance in the Soul Cake Banjo mix-up. Seemed like it worked for a minute, and then Bivers had it on lock. So put another three points on that on that total. I believe that makes our score 11 to four in favor of the defending champs and that's only with two sets remaining which means for quinnipiac really it comes down to this they have to win this set or at least get some major points on the board to push us to that fifth and final set and this is a pivotal moment for both of these teams only two spots really remaining backs are against the wall for the bobcats who do you send out I mean, you've got to send out a player capable of getting a double three stock. And you know Sienna is going to answer in turn. Because you've got to be aware that, well, you need to get these clean wins. You need to smother them out. If you're Sienna, you don't want to give them a chance to get that overtime where Quinnipiac could clutch out. You just want to stifle them here and now before any momentum, any drive to win can overwhelm your own. Players have been locked in for this fourth set. Mr. Purple is coming in for the side of Quinnipiac and for Sienna, it is Lax. Lax was one of the players that you and I put a little emphasis on for this Sienna roster because we knew that Fox on an online format could be rough at times, but Lax has looked very clean in the few appearances we've seen here 
at this land. On the flip side of that, Mr. Purple, one of the captains of this Quinnipiac roster who's been here, I think, since season one. And this Ness has been very strong. It won week one, or sorry, in uh, the quarterfinals against Boshi Koopa. And then yesterday, it failed to get the job done against Cross in that Manhattan matchup. Now he's looking for his redemption here to try and keep Quinnipiac's chances at this championship alive. He has to take down Lax. This is a this is a pivotal moment for both these schools. I'm surprised that we haven't seen the two tried and true Shulk players come out here. They're both putting a lot of pressure on these two players. I feel like you've got to save them for the end when they matter the most, but I do like seeing Mr. Purple here against Lax. You know why? Because Sienna won the last game, they send out their player first. So Mr. Purple is a counterpick for Lax. Mr. Purple is fighting on their own terms here. This is matchup confidence right here. They are confident in their ability to take down Lax. The Lax has quite a few tricks up their sleeves. So we'll see if they're able to do that here in this pivotal game. Fox versus Ness, likely the case here for game number one as we're getting those button checks out of the way. And again, this is the grand finals here. If Lax takes this set by, I believe, anything more than five points, it's over. And Sienna will have completed the three-peat. So it is up to Mr. Purple to deny that from happening, to give his team one last chance in this set overall. Any points for Quinnipiac keep them alive, or a four-point victory will force that fifth and final set. But if you're Quinnipiac, realistically, this has to be a set win for Mr. Purple to keep their chances afloat. Yes. Wearing the backwards baseball cap with your mane, you've got to be ready. You've got to be looking nice, looking clean as Mr. Purple is here to take on Lax. Now the edge is where this is going to be played. Fox with his infamous ledge trapping off of the unreactable short hop against Ness's amazing edge guarding with how prolific the magnet edge guards are and of course the infamous yo-yo. Lax on the Fox and Mr. Purple on the Ness here, PS2, the site of game number one. We'll have to see, too, the combo game of both of these players has been on point throughout the, this weekend overall. Both playing dangerously around the center stage. He got the drag down of the fair, but he couldn't get the grab in time. The jab beats it out, but here, Fox is off stage. Side B will land, and the percent really starting to rack up. These are two characters that I feel like can really beat up on each other, especially when they're in disadvantage. Like you pointed out, the side B gonna land, the down smash from the yo-yo didn't hold it long enough, so Lax will be able to make it back. But the side B drags Lax down all the way to the depth. And knock number one is taken off the board. Yeah, perfect interrupts right there. You've got to be more comfortable going for that lower recovery. But then again, if you do go for that lower recovery, you can be completely stuffed out by uh, the up beat, or the up smash, rather. It's a double-edged sword where either way, it's Mr. Purple who has the chance to react just like this and get, react they do with a clean sending spike every single time until you get the kill with the down smash. Three to one, it's like you said, when Fox is off stage, Lax is in trouble. Only 89% here, but a pivotal stock. Remember, Pango got that three stock against Billy Shilly. Lax trying to deny a three stock here from Quinnipia. 116, and Fox has plenty of kill power. And Mr. Purple trying to play carefully, a little less carefully there, and the up smash lands, and it's two to one. Yeah, they tried to go for that drift back on the forward air, but Fox, Lax, just let it rip a little earlier than Mr. Purple was ready for. As now Mr. Purple boxes you out again, forces a low recovery right here, but the best angle you could riding up the stage a little bit in order to avoid that yo-yo. Back through to get Lax off stage. He's still not out of dodge. That side B, oh. I like the idea, but the up smash is just too good. And Mr. Purple, the pop-off in game number one. Two more points headed the Bobcats way.
A mid-set pop-off. That's so you know they are invested in this match. They're looking to go all the way right now. Mr. Purple, two more points on the board. Quinnipiac definitely still in this. Definitely still alive and kicking going into the latter parts of this series. A huge win there for Mr. Purple to get two points on the board. Game number two. We're getting word about the picks and bans now. Looks like Yoshi's, FD, and Lilat are off the board here. And I'm curious, what are your thoughts here for Lax going forward? He falls in game number one and a pretty solid victory for Mr. Purple. What do you look for here for Lax to change in his game plan? I mean, the sad truth of it is you need to get prevent yourself from being put off stage as often. Because Mr. Purple has shown time and time again that if you're off stage, it's a death sentence for you. So what you got to be doing is you got to be playing around these safely spaced aerials. Know when your pressure is actually safe or when Ness's amazing Nair out of shield will punish you. And that sets you into an off stage situation. We'll have to see here. Battlefield, the site of game number two here. Remember, Mr. Purple takes this set, then he gets the bonus two points if he takes this game. But Lax, if he takes this game, we're headed to game number three between these two, and every single stock, every single point matters here as we're coming down to the wire. Percent relatively even here on this first stock, and I like this stage pick too. Those side Bs that put in a lot of work for Mr. Purple, and again, a little bit more mitigated here as you see the shine come out as well. Good usage of that. Didn't really see that in game number one from Lax. And this safe shield pressure right there, that four tilt into the immediate jab, it gets through Mr. Purple's defenses, but now you get off. Oh no! But the chance right here is... Oh, Mr. Purple, SD's trying to get back to stage, and that means that Lax is going to get a stock lead here on Battlefield. Ooh, quickly mitigated by that up smash, but that SD, unfortunate for the side of Quinnipiac, but... Look at this, Lax, the quick conversion. 42, make it 52, still trying to stay in the face of this Ness and trying to rack up more and more percent. Mr. Purple has to play carefully here. Has to try and find a way back down to stage around these platforms. Lands a forward air. Those side Bs, again, not quite finding their mark. Lax is finding their way around them, finding the counterplay here. The Nair to get him off stage. Holds that forward smash, but he'll be able to up beat back to the ledge. The Nair gets him off stage once again. Just it grabs the ledge once again. Be able to make it back to center stage. And what does Mr. Purple do here? He's got a percent deficit to work with, but he's got stage control, but only for a moment. Lax closing the distance so well. Yeah, I love what I'm seeing right here. As you can see, Mr. Purple is playing the spacing game once again. Now you have the opportunity to finish them off, but goes for the up smash instead of the down smash. No standing out. Now it's Lax with another chance to recover. Gonna go for it. No, they go straight to the ledge, straight into the yo-yo. I was thinking maybe a high recovery, but no. Mr. Mr. Purple is covering that too with the up smash. Oh, he air dodged around Lax there. He thought he could get a punish, but no chance there. Lax on his last stock. Dash attack, 51% to his name. Thought we were about to see another rocket here, but the uppies are starting to land. 77 to Lax now. He'll be able to grab the ledge for the roll around. Is it enough? No, the up smash not going to take the stock point yet. Forward air to get him off stage again. Not sure if he has a jump available. Looks like he doesn't. He'll up beat back, but the yo-yo again and again. It connects. No, not enough, but then another one. That will do it. And Mr. Purple back to back two stocks. And it comes down to the fifth and final set. You pop off, Mr. Purple. You earn that. You deserve that. As you can see, you have put your team within the spitting distance of victory. Quinnipiac, still a chance to get the run back here. What a set from Mr. Purple to bounce back from yesterday's loss to Cross. You had to wonder how his confidence was feeling after that play. And especially after dropping oh. the first stock to an SD, you had to wonder if that was shaking him at all. But after that pop-off, you could tell he was feeling it as he gets back-to-back -back two stocks against Lax in set number four. In a beautiful way they're doing it too, up smash, yeah. I mean, the ledge pressure felt insurmountable. It really did. I mean, 
I didn't see a way for Lax to get around it. Sure, maybe you could risk something with a high recovery, but even then, the fact that they were going for up smashes as opposed to down smashes meant the high recovery would have been called out. Is who is this being sent in? Is that who I think it is? Is that I know Bako's on the stage? I need to know, is that Knight? <laughs> that's the detriment of being an online league, I can't quite tell. But yeah, <laughs> that's looking like Knight, the duel. Who else could it be in game five of Quinnipiac oh, versus wow. Sienna? The two duelists right here. Both of these players all season long have played Schultz, but as I mentioned before, when these two met in week 11, Baco opted to play Marth instead, and that series was last stock every single game except for game number three when Baco won via a two stock. Curious to see if he opts for that counterplay again, but like you said, who else could it be? We've talked about these players all weekend long. Baco has been Mr. Clutch for the side of the Bobcats. All of last season, he delivered every single time the Bobcats needed him to. And for the flip side, Knight, he has been prolific, dissecting people's game styles, tearing them apart. The runoff forward airs, the Schult Classic, his edge guard game just so strong and his defensive play even stronger at that. But I don't think it could end any other way. These two schools, these two teams, these two players, this is it. Grand finals on the line for one last set. I mean, this is incredible to watch and I'm so terrified to see because these two teams, I mean, these two players overall, we have no idea how the stage is going to affect them. This much pressure, on the line, who knows what could happen? Oh, I don't know for sure. It is literally like you said, offense versus defense. Unstoppable force versus the immovable object. Neither of these players will give up an inch as they grind against each other, but there's only one who can come out on top. You gotta remember, it is still gonna be Sienna with a slight point lead, but I mean, at this point, whoever wins this set is going to be your champion, unless there is a unbelievable swing in terms of three stocks. It would take a wild scenario for this to go to an overtime. We'll have to see. This is it. Oh, actually, well, this is a button check, but I mean, this is the final real set for these two schools. The winner of this, they get the crown. And one more time, what's, a, what's on the line here? These two schools, they must have been thinking about this for a full 365 days. Sienna, they have been the bane of the max existence because of how dominant they have been. Back-to-back -back MAC championships, and on their ways there, they've beaten both Marist and Quinnipiac to get there in, in the past two seasons. In Quinnipiac, they went from a seventh seed in season number one, barely able to qualify, to grand finals in the last season in the EGF. So here they are again. The nightmares, all the hard work, it's been a full season long. They have been waiting for this moment. Knight versus Baco for one last time to decide who walks away the kings of the Mac in SSBU. Game number one is underway. Stony face, determined, vibing, bopping out. Both these players are ready and willing to fight it out. Because this is an interesting one. Going for the wolf right here. I guess you know your character better than anyone else. And Baco knows that wolf is the bane of Shulk's existence. The wolf, an interesting pick, as you said. He's off to a little bit of a percent deficit here. We'll have to see how practiced it is on this first game. It's the down throw, jump art now online here for Knight. And the one thing that scares me here is Knight's edge guard game is so strong. If there's one thing he can do, it's edge guard this wolf. But go able to make it back to stage here. Dash attack, 
trying to catch the speed, the down smash. Dangerous spot here. Uppy will be able to get him back, but the down smash won't land from Baco. First stocks here so important. Smash are online. So many quick options here for Knight. But he'll just opt to back away here. Trying to buy some time with these lasers. Trying to rack up a bit more percentage here. Both playing around these high percents. Really one strong hit should do it. The run off four air won't catch. But the Ooh. reverse up B will. And Knight takes the first stock. The scoop into the finisher right there, and now you're on the rush down the speed. But your movement is called out by that mighty down smash falling through your stock. First stock's off the board. Relatively even here. Dash attack into the grab, but the shield art gets him out of that follow through on the combo. Buster art, so much damage could come online here either way. Just down throw, but no clean follow up. The shield. Baco knows all of these shulk combos, and so now, trying to play around them with this wolf. 65 to Knight's name here, as he finds the Nair. Just so much- Oh my goodness, what a down air from Knight! The spacing incredible, and Baco's on his last stop! What a swing soy! I don't believe what I'm seeing, as right now, the buster is racking up so much damage, this lead is extending, but it goes both ways, it swings both ways, and you can see that right now, Baco has the opportunity to try and take this stock away, well within Wolf's kill range. You can see spacing these back airs, the read with the down smash, the perfect spacing to avoid that shield grab. Again, they know their character's limitations better than anyone, and even if Knight might have slightly stronger defense, it doesn't matter, they still know how to break through it. Solid back air there from Baco to get this to a last stock scenario here. 56% on his last stock, but he's trying to find a way in. Knight spacing these aerials so well. They're coming out so quickly. The side B callout doesn't quite land. Dash attack, not gonna land either. 85 to Baco's name here. And he's trapped along this ledge. But the back airs doing a lot of pressure. Not gonna find their mark until right there. Making 98, smash art online. Dangerous spot here. Wanted the roll behind grab, but he won't get it. Forward air to stuff out this jump. jump bar. Now for only a second, and there will land. Baco dash attacks will connect. 109 right now, and Baco trying to find some footing here. Finds the forward air. Up air won't land quite yet, and the shield art being burned here early. This is a pivotal moment on that back throw. Yeah, I love that. Baco not over committing on that shield art, and now the smash art, it's taken away. That early kill option gone. You've got to get a stronger swing, as now that speed art and air is going to get you right to the ledge. Facing these forward airs, like you know, but you know that just like a windmill, they slip right through it every single time. Baco sliding up, the but air. the two frame with it is going to catch them, and Sienna goes up early. Game one goes tonight, and they are one match away from reclaiming the throne here. And it was a wild first game, but I feel like the difference maker, Knight was so clean in those ledge scenarios. Time and time again, this character just does so much work. That spike sent a message, and now we'll have to see if Baco can respond. And it's also just awareness. I feel like every single kill they got was so situational. They got that <laughs> reverse up B with the pin pinpoint timing against that wolf side B. And then using the speed art, they're able to confirm into the down air. That wasn't a read. That was a pure confirm based on the aerial momentum you get off of that speed art. This is pure preparedness. Meanwhile, the fundamentals from Baco have been almost insurmountable. Is now, oh, we're gonna see the sword fight on Final Destination. No platforms, no holds barred between these two specialists. I'm smiling like the Grinch right now. I've been waiting to see this matchup all year long. The Shulk ditto between the best two Shulks in the EGF. And here in game number two of set number five, if Knight wins this, Sienna will retake the crown. And Baco trying to deny that here. He has the percent, or no, he doesn't actually. Sorry, he's the one in the orange Shulk skin at 84%. Smash art online here for Knight means a lot more knockback is going to come on deck here. It's the forward throw. Won't find the forwarder off the back of it. 84 still on Baco, but he's got stage control. Run forward air. Should still be able to. Oh, the counter! What a play! Won't be able to get back. 
Oh no, he will the fade so much to it that jump bar online is crazy strong in terms of recovery. And Knight quickly switching to the shield art to keep himself alive here. Now the smash art coming online once again, but it's smash art's gonna get reversed on him with that back throw. Oh, and just barely getting on, recovering with that smash out online. I was terrified, and I know so was Knight, but Baco wasn't able to quite hit it, and now they're off stage. Percents are dead even, slashing at each other through the air. Ooh, but the forward air off the ledge will get Baco some mileage. The down smash covers the landing. Shield art isn't enough to keep you from going off stage. The reverse up B, though, isn't enough. Smash art with forward air. It's going to connect. It's turned against you, and Baco in the lead. Only for a moment, though, the up tilt and the instant smash heart smart play there from Knight to even things back up immediately. Stock number two now, starting to be worked our way at. Buster online for Knight, trying to find some damage here. He does shield art online. Baco, known for burning those shield arts very early. 66% to Baco's name here. Finds a down tilt, but he can't find much off of it. Knight playing so well defensively. 20% to his name now. The 77 of Baco. They both opt for speed here. Trying to get out those quick areas. The spacing game on point for both of them. Finds the back air. Run off forward air. The reversal now. The jump art comes online. Smash art now at the ledge. Forward air won't connect. And Baco will be able to make it back. Gets the grab onto the back throw, but the jump art instantly burned. Now into the shield. Gets the grab. A little bit of damage done. But it's Baco who has to play careful here. He's at 101, and Smash art should come online and any moment now for Knight. Back there right here, an edge situation. We've seen Baco get mileage off this before. Baco plays a lot around these reads, a lot around huge momentum swings out of nowhere. We've got to see one of those here and now, but Knight is refusing to give up any territory, a single inch of ground. As they get onto the ledge, jump art now offline, no arts at all. It's edge guard city right there. But that side B mix up the backslash gets you back to the ledge. And now you have a chance to finish off with the smash art, but shield art to cover it. So many options to cover between the two of them. The back hit of Nair. He, gets, he ends up air dodging around the back air. And the runoff four air. That does it for the second stock of night here. He's trying to answer back quickly here. Immediately burning the smash arch. But the back air doesn't get the stock quite yet. The runoff won't land either. Neither will the uppies. And the, it's going to be Buster Art used here by Baco. Risking it all here. This could be a ton of percent and a little bit easier to get the kill. Backslash lands and there's the back air. Last stock here in game number two. Oh, look at this though. Already damage stacking up. Shield out on both sides. It's a fast paced brawl right there. But you get the grab. Shield out early from Knight right there. Knight is so comfortable fighting in this shield art, looking for counter hits. But Baco will never give it to them. As now it's Baco's turn with the defense. They drop it immediately though. They want to be able to hit hard and hit fast as they get facing these back airs. But right now it is Baco with the edge. 68 and more coming as the Smash Art, or sorry, Buster Art is used. Now Smash Art online for Baco. Trying to find a way to take this stock early if he can, but both those arts will now be offline. Looks like speed was used there, and now Knight is off stage. Shield Art used, the up air doesn't connect, and now the turnaround here. What can Knight get off of this? Not much. Shield Art spammed, and now jump for both of them. Be at the ledge for only a moment. The runoff forward air, not enough to get the job done. Speed used now by Baco. Threatening those arts, there was Knight. Has to land! Oh! Catches the landing with the up smash! And we're going to game number three! This is as far as we could possibly go. As close as these back championships could possibly come. Right now, Baco looking like they barely won that out. But it was the offstage clutches again and again that were the difference maker for Baco. And then catching the landing with that up smash. How else could it end? Game three, Baco versus Knight. This is the storied rivalry that goes back years. And I can't wait to see the next chapter in it decided here. You are watching history in the making. The very first EGFC Mac LAN between these two schools. The championship will be decided by the winner of the next game. How vital, how important is every single move, every single frame, and these players know it better than anyone. Will we see that Shulk Ditto again? It's gotta be on Baco's mind here. 
curious to see if that is the case once more. We'll have to see. Look at that character select screen. Looks like it was. Triplats were banned out. And now we get ready for game number three. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. The winner of this match is your MAC Championship. Will it be the Dynasty or will it be the up-and-comers? Baco vs. Knight for the MAC Championship. Gonna be Echo's dead even right now, but that air dodge slow. Oh, I was terrified. One mistake can mean doom. If you're caught without your resources off stage, ooh, going for a counter too. You can tell Baco is feeling something. Are they getting the right vibrations, the right reads? That's only to be determined. But based on the percent, I've gotta say yes. Here's Baco with the early percent lead, but it can be quickly mitigated. That counter's gonna get punished here. The shield art to be very dangerous here and now speed comes online he's near starting to connect as well now the forward throw to get him off stage but only for a moment jump arc gonna get caught that upbeat back to stage and now speed arc comes online look at how even the percents are smash arc gonna get burned here away into the jump and there's the down air from Baco. he waved the finger saying no 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 where are you going and stock number one is off the board and listen to this intense music. Both these players fighting for their lives right now. As Sienna with the lead, is he gonna slip away? Baco right now is looking untouchable, but with the smash art, it doesn't matter if you're untouchable. One little scratch and you're dead. But now the speed art from Baco, they're looking to rack up this damage with the rush down, but the jump is called out. No jump at all. And Knight saw that and they were bloodthirsty going for that forward air. Those runoff forward airs are just so devastating for both of these players. They put in so much work. Buster Art online, and now he's being caught. He has his jump, though, and he can't get back! Two spikes back to back for Baco! It's the last stock for Knight! A clean stock lead for Quinnipiac! Could this be the upside of the entire tournament i can't believe this right now buster are online but they switch off of it immediately knight their defense so strong they knew they can't give up any unwanted percent right there landing there puts Baco into the corner can you keep them there at these space aerials the forward airs the back airs knight is an unmovable wall right now they will not give up any territory even though they're down a full stop shield art being used to approach because that's what you need to do right now shield art from both sides both of them don't want to give up any territory at all shield for shield speed for speed and jump art now used by Baco. he's at 101 percent here still trying to find a combo opener and he does for the moment now speed and shield or sorry speed and jump are switched Baco is at the high percent smash art forward air that's the catch and we're on the last stock scenario whoever takes this is winning the mac championship we can hear the crowd through the producer's mic. That is how loud these people are getting. These people, they're so ready for the win as right now. Look at this. Even though Knight at such a high percent, they're not willing to give up this clutch factor. But Baco has been known for their clutch factor in the past. Knight playing so clean. Textbook Shulk right here. Optimal. But is Optimal enough? You need to go beyond Optimal to win out the match. 51 to 86 right now. One mistake could do it. Is that Baco without a jump? He'll air dodge back to the ledge. Smash Art's online. Won't get the grab though. The roll back to stage. The spacing of these aerials, vital, critical to both of these players. The back air lands for Baco. Jump Art's gonna get used. Burns the early slash so he won't get down air for a third time this game. The forward air's back and forth. The Nair will connect for only a moment, but both of them are relatively at kill percentage here. The back slash forces him away from the ledge. Playing carefully once again. Forward air from Baco. The runoff. Is that it? Yes, it is. They've done it. They've slain the tyrants. Quinnipiac. They've won the MAC championship. And the celebration bouncing across the stage right now. Quinnipiac, the champions of the MAC championships presented by EGF in the Shobo Hotel. I cannot believe it. The Shobo Hotel is shaking right now with the volume of this pop-off. Well deserved, well earned. Quinnipiac has fought through so much to get here and they needed this win. Sienna finally dethroned. Season one, they had to forfeit numerous matches to get to the playoffs and they faced CN in the first round and lost. Season two, they had four overtime matchups that Baco won 
and they got to Grand Finals and were stopped by Sienna. And here in Season 3, they were on a mission, undefeated in MAC Conference play, undefeated through the first two rounds of the tournament, and here, in the last moments, Baco, Mr. Clutch, does it again, and the boys from Quinnipiac have won the MAC Championship. What a wild run it has been for the Bobcats. And what a way for it to end, too. Down to literally last hit. One interaction, one forward air, all to decide it all. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better show than that. I can't believe what we're seeing, Soy. That, it, seeing an upset like that, oh my god, it gets the heart racing. Well, I, I, it's palpitating right now. I, I can't believe on that last stock... I mean, I know it's a ditto, so you often see a lot of the same options, but the fact that there were so many times they were both narrowing past each other, past each other with the forward airs, time and time again, the spacing on those aerials was critical. They both knew it, and they were both so clean. But that is it for us here at the Showboat Hotel. That is it for us here at SSBU. Thank you all so much for watching. Once again, your MAC champions are the Quinnipiac Bobcats, and over watch grand finals are coming up next we'll see you there
Let's kill it. Let's kill it. Hello, Atlantic City! <laughs> I am Waffles for Sid, and you guys may recognize FBI Tugboat already from yesterday. And we are thrilled to be joining you at the Showboat Hotel for Grand Finals Day! Hey Tugboat, how are you doing going into today? I am feeling pretty great now, Waffles. I know that you got to watch the Rocket League action, so you'll notice kind of a similarity here in this matchup. The Red Fox is taking on Iona College. That's the Gales over here. They're going to be on the right side of this stage. Just to the nines as well. Look at that. Got the eye, the eye nod here. Nothing from Numero Trace. Number Quattro. That's number four. Not giving us too, too much either. Love the hair, number five, but nothing. Number six just <laughs> stared right down. Ice in his veins. Concentration on the brains. Looking at this one. Little, little eyebrow action. Number two, number two. No, nothing wrong with uh, <laughs> copying the teammate. Number three. Kind of looking like he wasn't 100% sure on the commit was. Look wise, not sure. Five, six, look. Ooh, oh my God. Okay. Mom. Hands down the dub. Hands down the dub. <laughs> Number five. Everybody right loves here. mom. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> gotta, gotta, gotta give the mom a shout out. What are you doing uh, here in Atlantic City competing for your college? There Gosh, it is. Shout out, mom. Come on. Come on, people. Come on, people. <laughs> Lots of love out there. All the moms and the families supporting all the players making it here and, you know, being at this grand finals here at the land facility at showboat i gotta say i bet the tension is off the chains there oh yes oh yes we are looking at maris college came on into this one got a buy initially but beating sienna i think definitely proves that they have deserved to get their ticket punched on in here to this grand finals <laughs> action now i own a college taking down fairfield in that quarter finals action down there those were uh it was a long time ago though you know, we got a best of five coming up. <laughs> we got our uh, our maps being selected here. Now, this is not a set map rotation, correct? These are teams that are picking these and with a full formal pick band right, stage waffles. Right. Is that correct? Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. And well, so our first map is going to be Oasis. Um, you see there in the bottom corner, it says oh, yes. final starter. And, you know, Oasis is a good control map. There's a lot of open area and a lot of cover to really play around. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, control can be a bit of a tempo setter, too. So really curious to see which team is going to come out with the most fire. It's vim and vigor. <laughs> Again, uh, if we just had to go on the previous, I think... Iona might be at a slight, you know, Maris just put up a little bit more when it came to this pan over here earlier, right? And that's all we really have to go <laughs> off of. Obviously, Ken Ram, we got plenty and plenty of regular season stats. So let's come on and hit you guys with those. Maris College coming into this out the MAC. Only one match loss here, Waffles. Only one wow. match loss. Crazy stuff. Jeez. And, you know, that's got to be a little bit intimidating going up against. And mm -hmm. uh, Iona had a great match actually yesterday against Quinnipiac. They went all the way to game five and not just game five, but round three of control for game five, mm. right? The full distance possible and, you know, had a lot of really great displays. Um, some nasty Farrah Mercy combination that I am expecting to see from them today as well. It's been a very, very popular combination since season zero here at Waffles. No reason oh, to yeah. believe that's going to stop or that it'll somehow randomly be that combination not happening going on into Overwatch 2, right? We'll talk a little right. bit about uh, you know that and some of the news that we've gotten, obviously. Woo, Overwatch finally. Scene has been, <laughs> yes, the Overwatch scene has been rejoicing <laughs> the past week or so here, Sid. Talking yeah. about these squads, uh, we already got it. Marist College numero uno, top dog here within Woo. the... EGFC overall, as well as within their conference, as well as within the MAC conference here. Looking at Iona, not a bad team by any means, but not even quite a top 10 team quite yet. There's number 11 there. Iona College, obviously out the MAC, coming on in at a seven to six, yeah, seven to six win loss record right here. So just simply numerically a little bit different there, Waffles. Yeah, it's definitely going to be tough. And with Marist has with Maris performing so well throughout the EGF season in general, um, they've had a lot of time to really refine and polish some of those, you know, small things that really bring them together and help focus fire. Um, their Hammond and Tracer plays coming through from Maris look oh, yeah. like they are oh, yeah. just 
on point, in sync, mind melded. And not with just the Tracer and Hammond synergy, also with the rest of the team who is mm -hmm. pushing the front line. Um, I saw a lot of uh, pincer maneuvers coming through from them in their previous match. And, you know, I'm wondering if Iona is ready for the pressure that. Marist is going to bring from the multiple angles. Um, Oasis really yields itself to be encircling around the team that's defending. So it could be uh, tricky if you're on the defensive there as well. Yeah, obviously, I'm going to start, take that, uh, take that hill first, and then play the rest of the game on right. that defensive side. But uh, you know, that'll be easier said than done, no matter which team you are. <laughs> yes, Maris might be that numero uno, those top dogs, the head honchos, the cream of the crop here, Waffles. The syrup it goes on top of those delicious breakfast Ooh. confectionery, right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, I think that Iona College not only knows that Overwatch more so than other games, honestly, that is how you play on the day. And it's right. really who is going to know these maps best and who is really going to utilize these DPS. Now, we saw Cloud and we saw... Sizzit, he changed his name. Sizzit, Sizzit, okay, gotcha. you. Changed that name up. We saw Sizzit and Cloud both on the Cassidy yesterday, right? The Cowboy. Yes, a lot of value in that. Oh, yeah. I believe that we won't see that again. Well, and there were pockets up the wazoo for those DPS players to really get the damage and bring even more value to their team. Uh, so far, though, Iona set up in the far side room and set up in advance before uh, Maris successfully taking down one after another. And it uh, looks like they're going to go ahead and be able to take this point first. Yeah, that's going to be Maris. Uh wholehearted W's right here. Even Trader Solo Dolo taking out a couple at the end. Sam X forced to take a long walk off a short pier right there. Iona, at least it was quick. It was definitely pretty quick. And well, Marist here is still going to be holding defensively strong, right? It's King of the Hill once you've taken the point and now they've opened up with the Ant Matrix. Iona doing a great job at kiting back, avoiding that damage. I've seen them do this in their passing. Someone from behind! No one was looking to the left enough, and that is going to be a huge opening opportunity for Iona to push in and take the point for themselves for the first time this round. Gotta say, face misc. It looked like they were diving into death, doom, delirious destruction right here, Waffles. That is not the case. Finds not no. one but two right there. Now the res does come through. Majin will be playing the rest of this cool off, cool down off. It's 30 seconds, 40 seconds or so long as cool down in Overwatch for a reason. Iona, though, a lot of ultimates on board afterwards. Here comes the attempted high noon. That is going to find one. Traders finding healer as well. So DPS and healer both deleted. And even without like some crazy fast paced ultimates, this is still both teams able to take at least a couple kills. And this back and forth that we're seeing shows that. Marist and Iona know they have win conditions that they can capitalize on and engage with. And they're being success successful when they want to do that. And look at that, 45% and counting for Maris now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, just, just the run right now, technically doubled up against Iona for a little bit. But now an early kill, this this game so far has been marked by early kills, Sue Waffles. Engagement already through here on the side, and a shatter to counter! Thais is gonna go ahead and take a seat on the ground. There's still exchanges back and forth. Iona wants to keep pushing this, and now they have the advantage. They wanna take Maris off the point, and Maris wants to stall this out as long as they can. They have the numbers and the people to do so, and it's control, Tugboat. They want to wring out every little bit of possession they can before giving this up, and with two kills on that barrage? Man, that's discouraging for Maris to push in. Yeah, so that's going to be a lot purchased off a single barrage as well. I love how Calamity just simply waited and kind of played their hand on top of the Doomfist that was finishing up their ultimate, coming back from the Meteor and whatnot, and then turn attention immediately onto the D.Va on the other side as well. Sam X, Calamity not able to live through that, or excuse me, Traitors and whoever was playing the Pharah, or the Doomfist <laughs> earlier. My oh my. My oh my. It's still technically early. It's esports early, people. Esports right. early. Immortality Matrix. out. Nice charge. Go ahead. 
Oh yeah, Ant Matrix already used two from Maris. And that's gonna be a sound barrier! That's the nail in the coffin they needed to kick Iona off the point once again. And now with 86% left, Iona has their back against the wall and they are in last fight and sprint through the last fight territory. Sprint it will be indeed. No longer that marathon action, Iona. Last few bid here, shatter out, nothing nice happening, block. calamity, and that Great is gonna touch. be on top. Iona still moving forward, they don't want to give this up quite yet, but it is quite the dream to keep alive. One after another going down as Maris still continuing to hold this point, and that's going to be Maris taking the first round of Oasis. I love this, I love this. 100 to 59 as well, Waffles, that doesn't spell out some massively one-sided no. game in our first <laughs> game on broadcast, right? Our first and only, excuse me, this is Grand Finals. Right. This is Grand Finals. Maris, uh... <laughs> College Iona going and be doing battle on the second map of this control game mode, the kind of the King of the Hill game mode right here. It is impossible to tie, so we will see controls on the beginning and on the end of this matchup, just in case you're just joining us, or in case you haven't watched a whole lot of Overwatch, guys. Really nice job coming through from both teams. I loved all of the win condition engagements they were using. And, mm -hmm. you know, we saw some of the DPS just pop off on their own as well. Oh, I love a Sombra coming through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's in a game where everybody's Sombra, special. Her ability to remove that is just so powerful and can be so devastating. And the speed coming through from Thunderkit's going to let Maris get set up way in advance before Iona this time. Iona opted to actually hmm. take a little bit wider, longer route, uh, waiting for this engagement here on this side. And it's a small room. Everybody's going to be brawling up close. The pepper damage coming through a bit from Iona as they try to push forward, but the point has unlocked. No one has tapped it yet. Iona steps on just at the perfect moment and still Maris taking them down after they ripped apart that immortality field. Yeah, so Maris, they might lose a player here and again, but it seems like Iona might be suffering from a lack of coordination when it comes to team shots, right? This is not an Iona College squad that is fighting these like massively different places. It's not like they're missing their shots. It's not like they're going forth and just fat fingering ultimates. It's right. just the coordination of damage and early. Marist has been able to find one or two kills pretty much. But sometimes before Iona seems like they're really waking up and focusing damage. Uh, ultimates are not. Oh, now with another hack in the back. Through. And this facement's care is getting so much value on this Sombra. The hacks coming through, the information to help their team capitalize on everyone in I on Iona who is just maybe lagging behind a bit. A massive juggle coming through from Taze here on this uh, Winston and once again Maris gonna hold this point and Iona gotta regroup. Yeah Iona looking a little bit worse than the first gotta say they're getting ultimates on board here Oblivion's has done crazy things with shatters already Sam X got a triple on the self-destruct if, if, if my uh, memory is serving. And there's not going to be that healer on the other side with the immortality line. Oh, Baptiste, right? There's the hack that got all six. All six people! Wow! Holy cow! What a beautiful play coming through from Basement. Going to shut down any, any attempt at engaging from Iona. Uh, you know, Iona didn't get to use any of their ultimates since mm -hmm. the EMP was so early. So that is a bright side moving in towards this uh, last fight territory. Yeah, again, cannot be understated there, Waffles. Krev will probably get up to their immortality field after a few ooh, 10 seconds of fighting or so. Everybody mm -hmm. else is up there. Oblivion's flirting with that 100% right now. Once they have it, we'll see a go, go, go situation. Nope. Oh, oh there's a decent shadow. That's four nice. out of six right now, but Nimmer's able to traitors. The massive here from Traders. He just takes the Blizzard right out of the play. Iona is still moving forward to try and keep this point. Self Destruct made a little bit of room for, from Sam, but Maris wants to hold strong. Taze on this. Winston is just killing it here on the aggression. And while Iona handling, trying to trickle in, it's going to be Maris handling that trickle and, uh, well, really trying to set a different tone from what we saw uh, on that first map really different not just within this in itself but with the score line as well waffles this is a pretty fast control map even having an emp on the end for two players just a little bit of cleaning up action mm -hmm. going off of a 100 to 60 that th this is no real fight 
within the game. Of course, but you got, this... you got two, uh, two areas of effect healers as well. Oh, you right. have a Thunder Kid. Nobody on Maris is going to fall here. No, but I will say, seeing a trickle like this from Iona and such a really good stall coming through mm -hmm. from Iona Victory. means that Maerst is going to have a really hard time moving into uh, maybe some of the hybrid and payload maps where the spawn advantage is highly in favor of the defense and um, you know one little slip up can cost you that last third checkpoint push. Obviously though Maerst did a great job here. Uh, came back with quite a fire from that first round and uh, looking to see who can keep setting this pace you know what i didn't even see that uh that boop off with the traders <clears throat> excuse me with the traders uh winston ultimate right there this is so immediate kills coming in that form as well uh, again these first two control games were in every way shape and form dictated by the pace of the tank play we saw shatters hitting four out of six players uh unless they're literally just solo shattering from a corner by themselves which right no right which... should ever do <laughs> anytime you get a shatter of four out of six this is going yes. to be a team that is going to lose a team fight unless there's literally immediately immortality lamps other ultimates all, all kinds all I'm talking about not just one, but a combination of ultimates after that to save the team. When you're talking about two thirds, right? Yeah. Sixty percent of your team getting dropped down by a shatter. There's just not ideal situation. Wait, four out of six? Yeah, two thirds. Well, I agree with you there, and I have to say the additional point is you can't do anything when all six of you have been EMP'd as yes. well. Yes. That's that's Sombra's ability. I talked about how powerful that was in a game where everyone is special. And she literally rips away all your abilities <laughs> and leaves you sitting there uh, just stranded, waiting I for damage to I did a girl like that hit. once. <laughs> 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 Seriously, though, uh, it, it, is, it is disheartening, to say the least. I remember when Sombra first came out, I was like, w w w what sense does this make, right? I, I don't know. I don't know. Much better place now. And of course, Sombra is getting a pretty decent rework for overwatch 2 not all the ramifications of her kit has been confirmed but the right. overall rework along with bastion along with doomfist has been confirmed for the great game of overwatch 2. yeah and i'm really curious to see how long these changes will stick right we've seen these patches come out and immediately they mm -hmm. need to be recalibrated so there's yes, always going to be yes. some of that working through this initial kinks period but i am really excited to see what's going to be coming through from that um also you know the overwatch league uh schedules and updates have been updated so mm -hmm. uh there's a lot of news here on the overwatch front and finally uh, yeah. it's a pretty big weekend <laughs> for it in general <laughs> it is waffles it is i'm i'm excited for it i i am very very excited for it after a drought in the form of information the lack thereof unfortunately from blizzard and whatnot all the things going on over <laughs> at blizzard and all the things going on with overwatch to the game oh, specifically yeah. all the things with the <sighs> with COVID and whatnot, which seems like, knock on wood, seems like we are reaching towards the end of, thank God. Ooh, God knows man. I've said that one before, though. The waffles, oh, God knows hard I've knock said on that one. <laughs> that one on that. Yes, exactly. Let's go for, let's go for two rounds of that one. Yeah. Check it out, players, right now. Everybody decked out in their best Iona gear. Obviously, there's Maris Red Foxes man. right here. Uh, except for the one guy, you know, well, not except. He's got the jersey on the outside, but he's got, like, the, the frog head and whatnot, right? To yes, and you know you got to be in your flow state there, and make sure you're in your, you know, your lucky gear as oh, yeah. much as oh, yeah. needed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and at the end of the day, Sid, uh, this is New Jersey. Nobody's expecting anything That's from you true. at all. <laughs> I'm totally kidding around. I'm totally kidding around. Fantastic, uh, fantastic place to showboat a hotel again. Pic very picturesque. I've been there myself. It is right there, really? right there on the boardwalk. I'm wow. not sure if you've ever been to the boardwalk there I in Atlantic not. City, Sid, but it is. I'm sure you've seen movies of it, TV shows with the with the boardwalk. A girl yeah. can dream. There you go. There you go. It, it is literally exactly as it is seen, as perceived in the movies and the TV shows that it is wow. in real life, and, and it is decently beautiful. I'm not I'm not gonna so... lie. All memory aside, all, all New Jersey slander aside, it is a it is a quite beautiful quite beautiful place. Maybe Taking a, a look at Overwatch uh, Two map. Potential oh, hey, right that'd be there. <laughs> that'd be pretty cool. That'd be pretty cool. I the mean, there are boardwalk callouts. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Right? That would be yeah, fun. Yeah. 
Well, Blizzard World action, and they, and they literally do have uh, on the main part of the uh, of the Atlantic City Boardwalk down towards the casinos and whatnot. They literally have like that 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 pier that goes out, and there's literally uh, rides and stuff like that. There literally is a, I think like a smaller roller coaster, but there is an actual roller coaster on yeah. the New Jersey Boardwalk. I mean, I'm over here in NorCal, so we have the Santa Cruz Boardwalk. Uh, we got a few rides over there as well, but it's not going to be what you find in your, you know, Anaheim, Six Flags, Disneyland stuff. Uh, but of course, one day I want to see Blizzard World. Uh, that would be a great thing to mm -hmm. fully mm -hmm. experience. Um, obviously, though, we're going to go over to Eichenwald for our first hybrid map, like yeah, you were yeah, mentioning. Yeah. So, you know, not getting to see the fun Blizzard World here, but uh, still going to go to the castle. Um, I really, really hope we get to see a lot of fighting on that bridge area. I love the amount of boot potential and how Lucio's can just come straight from left field and oh, clip yes. you right off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, seriously. My main, uh, at least a thousand hours or so on there, we're talking a little bit. It doesn't matter, people, right? that thousand hours is on console, okay? It's all Overwatch, all right? It's all Overwatch. I had masters and accounts, okay? It yeah, I had masters I... and it counts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm far from a master's player uh, personally, but I, you know, you gotta make up with your other strengths, and this is a team game, and having good synergy, communication, and focus fire can easily turn the tide of a fight, and it will outclass any solo player. Hello. 100% agree. 100% agreed, especially if you're looking at these teams, what we have on board. If anybody here, Calamity especially, even with the Oblivion's pocket, gets too aggressive, you're looking at, what, three hit scans on the other side between Cloud, Face Misk, and O-U-M? Yeah. man. Yeah, uh, that, that's just going to be rough. I would not be surprised if we see a little bit of a switch. Obviously, you got the Brig, you got the Orisa, and you got the Cloud, Cassidy, Forces, Forsai. That's just mm -hmm. what I call him. Easier for me. For Sai over here on the side of Iona. So I'm not sure if their two DPS picks thus far are really going to mm -hmm. be able to get a whole lot done, Waffles. Well, we also have Krev, who has subbed what? in here from Iona here on this Ana in the back line. And, uh, well, it's going to have the good sight lines needed to try and keep the team healed up. Mare's so far holding strong at this bridge point, and it's going to be up to Iona to really break through and find that opportunity. Yeah, speaking of finding opportunity, every time they've kind of poked heads in so far, they died, imagine. Full 600 Ugh. on the ball. Now, finally, the rotation left side. We got a team fight coming in. This damage coming through from Calamity in the sky is going to be a little bit of trouble for Maris, but they have two hit scan players in their arsenal online and Ooh. holy cow they're not even looking at the pharmacy at all they just look yep. straight at the ch main core of iona and from there whittle everyone who's left uh yeah very little color commentary to be said on this one like you said this uh pharmacy up top the Farah mercy combination up top if it gets ignored for any length of time, especially when you're looking at the relatively smaller shields on this other side, Taze with the projected, uh, yeah, obviously it's gotten a little bit bigger in time has passed, but at the end of the day, it is just it's stationary. You can't, you can't, you can't move it. Traders even smaller on the other side. Oh, oh no! It's Rev. Left Dang. Out yeah, just a little bit behind the shield. Typically, what? it's okay if you lag as a support. You know, you don't need to be pushing the front line with mm -hmm. everybody. But with how fast facements can move around on that soldier, just ran right behind him and clipped him with the visor. Yeah, as simple as that really was. Aimbot comes out. I think it's three and a half seconds. That's all it really, really takes on that last. That was mincemeat made. That's support on the other side. Look at Amaris, pretty solid defense so far. Here comes the Sigma ultimate. Oh, but stunned in the air! That has got to be devastating for traders. but looks like, once again, this is a team game, and his team had him covered. Absolutely. Uh, the stun comes in, doesn't matter, because traders and the rest. Now, I got to say, though, outside of Thunder Kit's rally coming in soon, they have OUM up, and that is it, my friend. 36, 37% for Taze, so kind of close to halfway, but Maze, or Taze would have to get a whole lot of damage just to get something going. Just like that, though, you see Sai, Iona, a little bit of a change right here, going cowboy for right now, just showed the Doomfist. 
really Valk here through Iona really and uh, going to be enabling that engagement. Oh. Majin does go down because that Ant Matrix from Ohm was devastating, just shredded everybody. And last, look, last game we saw Marist running um, a very damage oriented comp here on Volskaya, and they had a Bastion and they had. Uh, Ash and all of these other players shooting through an amplification matrix and it melted a Symmetra barrier, an ultimate. Oh wow. Almost oh, wow. instantly. Like I, it was less HP than one up. second. 10k HP I believe, right? Um, oh, shoot, Billy did the math on the stream and it was outrageous. Iona has got a tough battle ahead of them and they're engaging with a Nanode Winston. That is going to be a great advantage as he continues to try and laser around, but Faceman once again repeating a bit of history. Kites around the back and just takes them out with that visor. Yeah, that was just the face fix show. We just all temporarily got uh, a couple backstage passes and that is it. They'll move on to the next season. They'll get syndicated. We'll see that over here and wonder what it's like to be on the next stage. It's my god. Facebook yeah. did everything right there. Uh, there's, there's literally, like, yes, it's aimbot. There's really not much, a whole lot of extra time that Facebook could have literally got damage in. And then the perfect positioning of the tri rockets on the end and on the correct player, right? Uh, right. Th th these tri rockets onto a tracer just simply mean a lot more than they do on any other player. Squishy or not from the great game of Rocket League. Rocket League. Within the great game of Overwatch. <laughs> ah, you're showing what game you're flexing over from FBI Tugbo. <laughs> there, there you go. I mean, I started casting on Overwatch way back in the Dizzy. It's just, uh, you know, I've, I've obviously the game has has changed a whole lot, right? Not just within gameplay, but almost everything about it, right? I mean, yeah, leagues change. Well, there's been a lot of reworks change, as well, and you know, people uh, change is good, right. and it's nice to know that some of it's on its way. It's not a, realistic to expect anything to happen overnight, but yeah, no, that's fair. these players, it is very obvious that they have been training very regularly to make this comfortable and make them, you know, have the synergy that we see here. Um, really excited to see Calamity back on that Farah, but it might come back to bite them with how good the hitscan players have been doing today on Marist. Yeah, speaking of hit scan players, this will be the first taste of a uh, true sniper action, right? You know, you got your Hanzos, you got your Ash and stuff. They have your even have the zoom on Ash and whatnot. We're not true snipers, right? You got Widowmaker <laughs> as the true sniper here for the great game of Overwatch. But we're not gonna see it here. Face mist switching on over to that echo very end. It's gonna be Maris' turn to try and push through this choke point, and it's gonna be a trap kill opening up the feed onto basement. Uh, always funny to see a sky, a sky character touch the ground, and well, unfortunately, in the exact spot you don't want to be. <laughs> yeah, like like you had so many options here. You had so many different options, and, and you chose wrong, Colonel Sanders. Looking over this outside area, just deleted. Control X, control. Ah. Wow, or control what? A control X? I'm, I'm, I'm. <laughs> well, Iona here still holding the point well. It looks like Taze is giving them a bit of trouble, and they can't quite seem to shut him down. They have put a lot of resources, though, into taking down the front line of Marist, and it's been really successful. Taze has been doing the disruption, but they haven't been able to cap the point, right? Maris needs to have that communication and they need to be capitalizing more on the opportunities that Taze is trying to create for them. This damage from Calamity is just ruthless from above. The Discord Orb has been placed on it and, well, that is definitely in an attempt to mitigate the value. Just mines all over the field though from Maris. It's going to be tough for Iona to continue staying and having any presence. Danger is on all locations and on all sides. Mares continuing to push forward and just flood into this a stick oh and it kills the, the tire kills are just in the time but it's still going to be Iona on the point trickling and holding as long as they can Mares is just respawning and running back as quick as possible and Iona here the tank left on the point yeah. Mares needs one tick here on Eichenwald to bring them to match point in grand finals and there it is Wow. Mares yeah. taking Eichenwald. These red foxes are simply on the hunt, Waffles. My, oh my. We saw an Arissa get taken out 
as this Siona College squad, or excuse me, as this Marist College squad was coming in, uh, literally about as fast as you can kill a tank like this. It, it, was, it was simply insane. It was simply insane. Face this. Every single time this mask comes down, uh, it might, might as well be bad, man. Or Superman. <laughs> that is the level of effect that this Soldier 76 is having on these games. These aimbot players right here are simply getting everything done. Right? Yeah. Where, where, where that was where that was earlier, and he was ending out a couple different tank players Someone that he could see or low that came off the back of some crisp and clear communications between these players, or it's just running through and just taking out squishies left, right, and center. It seems like half of these players even have their back to them, like they're not anticipating as it's coming in. Or hey, maybe they're all just fleeing waffles. You know, it's tough to flee from someone who's as fast as a Soldier 76 as also well. Very true. Uh, very they true. don't call him legs for nothing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he just was able to close that gap and really take advantage of the limitation of a shield, right? It's only so wide. That's all there is to it. You gotta, you gotta hide behind the shield. And, uh, you know, we had some really, really great shots of that. Huge mm. props out to our camera observer, <laughs> Capitano, uh, bringing us all these phenomenal angles and, you know, having us actually be there experiencing those visors with them. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So great. Experiencing visors. That's how uh, that's how I would say if I was uh, if I was embarrassed uh, if I was a embarrassed player I think I'd have more choice words. If I was Iono College and I was having to experience this tax visor. <laughs> Looking at oh man oh man. Looking next we got uh, uh, next map here we got Tim Temple of Anubis right? Mm -hmm. Is that what we're seeing? Yes. Yeah, Temple of Anubis. So yeah, little little two CP action classic stuff here for game for map number three. I would right. really really love to see Iona College come out. And just edge out Marist a little bit. I'm not yeah. talking about taking like some six to three advantage right here. Just Iona coming in and, and just playing exactly what they need to. Not trying to go for 100% when all you need is 61. Right. Well, remember what we saw in our first map as well. We saw a really great back and forth between Iona and Marist. Good. So we know Good. that Iona has it in them to put Marist on their back foot and to, you know, pretty much be ready for their aggression and capitalize on some of those win conditions. Win conditions, something else I don't think we've talked about enough, really. And maybe that's yeah. simple, it's just simply because the members of Meyer so far have been able to get a lot done with solo ultimates. And when I, mm -hmm. as I say that, Iona is doing the same exact thing. In fact, one of the ways I think that Iona is actually winning is the combination of ultimates. Like, this Marist College squad is so good that they can come through here and get a lot done with solo ultimates. But that's not mm -hmm. the name of the game here. This is a team-based right. game, Waffles. This is a team-based right. shoot, too. If right. Iona is able to snuff these out and kind of like be able to tell that they are coming, if they see face mask and they listen for this and they and they just get a shield up in front, and then face mask has finally put a little bit of pressure on, I'm not sure that these tack visors and whatnot are going to happen the same exact way here in your Temple of Anubis map. Yeah. This is in a wholeheartedly different game mode. There's a wholeheartedly different map. Objectives and everywhere else is different. And face mask, if they choose to play the Soldier 76, which personally I'm kind of the, the thinking like don't fix it if they broke, right? Um, I'm not sure. It's going well, so why play somebody else? You can always change within games. Maybe it's get true. an ultimate in first or something like that. Well, Maybe just see what their composition is first. Go ahead, Waffles. Iona really favors Calamity on that Pharah. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much we should expect to see someone other than Soldier. If we do, I think we'll see an Ash or the cast. Aww. Hey, what's Aww. up over there? <laughs> I uh, everyone there always, I mean, obviously having a good time. Yeah. Uh, we had some substitutions on Marist as a well. Oh, okay, they did this okay. in their previous round, um, in their previous uh, semifinals round. Mm -hmm. And once they made it to match point, they put in their, put in a new lineup. Um, we're going to have Emerald coming in for Cloud over on That's the DPS side. Okay. And uh, Vocal will be coming in for Thunderkit on the support side. Got it, so, got it. I gotta say, I love the fact that Marist has such a deep bench they can play off mm -hmm. of. Um, it also means that they are comfortable with everybody on the team synergy-wise. And that also, I think this is actually the most important thing. Everybody mm -hmm. oh, yeah. on Marist right now is getting exposure and experience playing live in front of an audience 
in grand finals, okay? Yes. That is a pressure you do not get to experience or have very often. And mm -hmm. what a treat to see now, so many people getting to experience it. It really is. It really is, Ruffles. I simply cannot agree more. The lights, the sounds, the pressure, everybody there Ooh. talking about the, the moms and the dads over there I, I, uh, <laughs> uh, showing up and like you know, being there. Like that's a different level of pressure, Sid. Like not just your teammates, not just your, your classmates and whatnot, not just players no. that might be looking up to you a little bit to kind of come forth and have those star performances looking at you face, miss. But everybody <laughs> there, right? Everybody there, the lights, the sounds, the pressure, everything else like that. Pressure can frequently crush players. Players. Yes. The pressure also creates diamonds, Sid. We'll see it how does. it goes in game number three. Who oh, will him. be oh, clutch awesome. enough? Yeah, we got to. Uh, we can hear everyone there cheering. Um, obviously, we're moving yeah. into match point of mm -hmm. Anubis and uh, looking to see if Maris is going to continue to hold strong. Pressure is on for Iona, and we'll see if uh, some diamonds in the rough emerge. <laughs> Yeah, no, we'll definitely see that one here. Now, as far as predictions, uh, lineup wise, you know, team composition wise, Ooh. you got anything kind of churning around up top? Like, as far Ooh. as what we might be able to see based on what we've already seen across maps one and two here, Waffles. Um, I would not be surprised. Oh, he if said, he "Hey, saw... mom." He oh, said, hey, mom. You melted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, absolutely. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe we saw uh, the May come through for Marist on the defensive end. They did show a bit of that when they were playing the two capture point yesterday on Volskaya, and you know, se separating people out and isolating them. It is only fun if you're the team isolating and not the one being isolated. <laughs> Separating people out in isolation. What is this? COVID-19? Right. <laughs> Mayor's College, Iona doing battle here. And like you said, match point, possibly the last map here, guys. Uh, Iona, and we have seen side switch, by the way, guys. Iona now on the left, Marist on the right. I'm not going to call these meme picks, Waffles. I'm not going to call them meme picks. No, but face we're mess still... the rest of Bear. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, go. we're, go, don't go. call the attackers. <laughs> they're they're here to mess with they us. They got like five seconds. They got like four seconds. Okay, like <laughs> and, and, and maybe yeah. maybe you're right. Maybe I'm I'm, I'm the one convinced. Thing. I mean, I also am a fa I I don't mind the initial sniper attempt, right? If yes. you're on fire, if you're in flow, take that what five to seven seconds maximum to try and get that one man advantage. It's massive if it's successful, and it's an extremely low risk. Emerald on the Hanzo Sniper is going to be already reaping the benefits. Iona is doing their best to mitigate some of the people pushing through and Whoa. Calamity finding that kill in the back line could turn the tide for Iona to keep this point. Oh, but Maers is coming in hot tugboat and they are coming in with a vengeance capping this point very quickly. Yeah, so what we have seen so far, Emerald playing on Cloud right there, everything happening. Vocal onto the Anna has the most ultimate charge right now on the side Ooh. of Maris, right? Vocal playing yeah. for Thunder Kid. Not the Thunder Kid, not the Cloud are playing poorly, just uh, no. evening out the play time right here for Maris in the grand finals. Game oh, match oh. as well. For point. Yeah, well, and Calamity is on that far, right? So that's mm -hmm. a lot of damage being pumped into Maris, which means. It's all on vocal to really keep everyone topped off and utilize their resources properly. Nano followed by the grenade right there to keep everyone topped off alive. Nice jump over that junk rat tap, junk rat trap by Taze as Amaris continues to aggress forward. There is a lot of damage coming through from yeah. Iona and they have a kill. I'm wondering if this respawn advantage is gonna be enough for them to really hold this point and to fight Maris off for this most recent push. Looking for a stick right there, Sai finding nice. another trap kill. Love to see this one, but it's gonna be a little bit too, a little bit too little, and a little bit too late, I think. Self destruct taking out Trev on the end. Yeah, defenders are gonna be able to hold onto this one. They get so much mm -hmm. closer spawns, and my God, Waffles, look at this. We are looking at Iona College squad absolutely glowing right now. That is six yes. out of six. We'll talk about it. I mean, you can pick whichever one you fancy for this engagement. There's a whole variety you can use, and, uh, you know, Maris is going to know that, well, they only have Ohm's trance to combat. That's a lot of the line, and Iona has a good opportunity to really set themselves ahead of the pace with their ultimate economy and cycling. 
I mean, both Sky and Calamity is ultimate ultimate decent stealer, just like uh, a lot of damage really quickly. I want to see what they use first, but that's going to be, yeah, Dragon's out now. Ooh. Maris finding two right yeah. there with the Transcendence and the, uh, the uh, Monkey Ultimate. That is crazy. That, that, those aren't even like incredibly damaging ultimates right now from Maris right now. And just like that, Not Shatter it. at the end, Oblivious tries wow. to get over to it. Not even gonna matter. That's O-U-N that pops up and immediately helps out the old teammates on this. Not gonna matter though. Maris drops not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six. My god, it's <laughs> nothing more. Vocal will have yeah. a ultimate there at the end, but but this is just time wasted off the clock. Yes, they took this first point, and yes, they can win off that if they hold Iona, but this is nothing doing for point number two so far. We saw this similar performance from Iona on the last map of our control where they were stalling out, stalling out, really preventing the point from being fully capped. And that is showing right here. Zero ticks on point two, regardless of Merit's current attempts on the push. Here they go for another one. Oh, grenade gets blocked by their own D.Va, but that's okay. Sent in the back is the self-destructive help make some space for Maris as they continue to aggress forward. Yep, to get that health pack. You were so low and well met the Reinhardt down below. Probably very surprising. Face Misk has that blade and the real question is who, who is he going to use on it? Don't want to be too, too close to this Reinhardt, but does manage to take him down in the process. This could be the cleave damage they need. One kill in the pocket for him. Another one looking at this. Coming through for Faceman, absolutely clutching it there as this Genji, three health left and oh, man, wow. it is Maris pushing oh, this wow. point. There it is, cleared them. Now it's time for them to try and cap this point, Tugboat. Yeah, but it's actually not gonna matter. Oh no, they do get first hit. After oh. all that, after all that, Waffles. After one. all that, with, with, the, with the Genji at literally like two health, I think you said? Three. <laughs> three health. Yeah. Single digit health. After all that, it literally just takes them sitting here and waiting for a while. And, and I think Iona kind of waited a little bit to come out of this. Nuss attempt coming through from Oblivions to try and keep this point alive here wow. for Iona. But wow. at the end of it, it's going to be Maris finally pulling away with the full two points capped. Insane. What, what a, talk about wow. a long point fight as well, Waffles. This is incredibly long. You're talking about like 90 seconds, that last little bit that yeah. Iona was forced to play on defense and rotate through their respawns. The simple fact of Maris keeping this one up all the way through, so far away from their spawns, from their anchor supports, from yes. everything else. The only the only health even here is that big boost we saw down bottom that the Winston, I believe that was Traders or Taze. Mm -hmm. No, that was Mar that was Maris uh, yeah, that was Maris tank, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, he was 41 down below, gets the health pack, and then, well, what do you know, runs straight into Oblivions and has to jump right out of there in the nick of time to try and continue pushing the point. Um, just some really great communication, and, you know, there's the, that's the synergy and the communication follow-up Iona is refining and is going to help them continue to fight against Maerst. Yeah, 100%, I gotta, gotta agree with you. We are looking at a Maris College squad, that, or Maris University squad, excuse me, the Red Fox is here, that'll mm -hmm. be knowing that they only have to hold this one just about full four minutes, no points on the very beginning, and that'll be it. That'll be a clean 3-0 whip for your Maris University squad, the Red Fox is there. Iona does not want that ha to have happen. The Gales will not be giving this one up so easily. They will not be going quietly into the dark, dark night. This Discord has been just tethered to Calamity almost all the time. They know that there's a lot of pressure and a lot of first damage potential coming through, especially with the pocket from Majin always on the damage boost. Right now, Iona is going to have to make a move to get to the point at some point. And, well, it is going to be around the side here. And, uh, well, they have the Sprite Heart, right? A brawling engagement is something they're going to look for, feel comfortable with. Calamity did get taken out early in the back, but it's going to be Sam going battle mercy here. And, uh, yeah. oh, it's, sorry, that was the baby diva. My bad. <laughs> Got excited on the blaster there. And uh, <laughs> you can probably see I do a little too much battle mercy myself. Maris will just... <laughs> Stop well, what, Iona no such thing on is too that. Much, uh, no such thing is too much battle mercy. <laughs> it's my deathmatch uh, choice pick right there. <laughs> Ooh, that's ballsy. I like it. I like it. 
was rather confident. No, but uh, getting getting back on this one, Marist, uh, just a couple couple shots away from full ultimate for Vical or for Vocal, excuse me, for OUM for Traders for Taze. Uh, everybody except their DPS is going to be able to get it going in this next, but it's Krev with the first ultimate on board so far. We'll see if this is utilized as this Iona squad is going to be rotating on through and trying to drop down yes. onto this first point. Here comes the signal ultimate. Nice early flux engagement is going to take Krev out of the picture and it's going to take the amp matrix out of the picture. That was an ultimate and definitely an opportunity for a win condition online and that is a great amount of time burned off the clock for Marist. Yeah, and so and that's really the name of the game right here is just burning time off, right? Uh, Maris right. knows this at a certain point. Give it another 90 seconds or so once we reach last fight territory here, Waffles. Uh, this will be a Marist squad. A Marist squad, the Red Foxes here. They're not really fighting against Iona. They're fighting against that sand in the hourglass, the chronological resource. That's time, y'all. It's <laughs> going to be left in this game. Rotated in again. Iona's tried this multiple times. We'll see if this one shakes out different. Ice wall this time going to be sectioning off a couple of people from Marist, but Oblivions is going to go down in the process. Marist has a lot of ultimates to work with online, and they are trying to cycle them and keep them conservative conservatively. This em Emerald here still has the Deadeye online, and with the damage being outputted, it doesn't even need to use it. Wow, yeah. Uh, the simple fact of not even having to there at the end. Now with 60 seconds left on this one. Marist drops this. Iona takes it. They'll be afforded a little bit extra time, of course, right? But uh, Iona, their tournament, their series, their game, their map, everything fixated on this right now. Vocal opens up with the Amp oh, Matrix no. and the wall blocks a bit of it. Krev though does go down, can't quite kite away from all of the damage and Marist here has so many resources online. This tire has a lot of pressure, needs to be big and what? Oh. Two people killed with the tire! That is devastating for Marist here and Iona has opened up the doors to take this first point on Anubis. Let's go Iona! <laughs> I love that. Things you love to see, people. Things oh you absolutely God. love to see. Now we're. Oh, that's another main tank down. Mare's in a bad spot. Move. They have sound. They have speed boost. Yes. They have everybody almost ultimate except for Psy Guy. They have three minutes and ten seconds left up top. They need. This is a snowball potential right here. Self-destruct moves a lot of people out of the way. Shatter's gonna clip two for Iona, and there's the sound barrier reinforcing them even more. They are looking to take this point and just steamroll Marist here on Anubis. Two ticks already in the back, and that's gonna be, oh, just in the nick of time, Marist stalling out on that echo but can they continue to handle this onslaught from iona no, iona just clips it 2.240 left on the clock iona says get out of here this is my map this is my yard a what single tire clutch play wow. guy purchased this entire map for them and again the least on life has been extended here there you go. Love to see these DR crowds getting lit right now. Hello, fellas. Iona, how you feeling? How you feeling? Man. I'm pretty sure they can hear us, right? Nah, they got that. They, they're in their headset game mode. And, gotcha. Uh, Makes sense. Makes sense. You know what? You can see it written all over their faces. Like the joy, the hype. Look at that. <laughs> Love back at everybody there. Oh, um, not good looks, not absolutely. happiness. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this does not inspire joy. <laughs> <laughs> like there has to be two sides to every coin oh, and yeah. Oh, yeah. you know Iona had their back against the wall okay Maersk yep. was at match point they were probably feeling a little comfortable they did their normal sub in routine and uh, you know Iona came to play absolutely massive plays coming through from uh, Syzygy there and that tire just we saw the tire dance for so long I was so yeah. stressed for him and what a play. What a clutch play. I, I think that they were waiting out not just the uh, not just like the attention to turn, but also the the immortality field, right? Right, right. Yeah, that's that's what it was. You had Got, to wait. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, three uh, enough to, damage to kill three players immediately mm -hmm. and damage onto the fourth tank. That's just that was just the beginning of the end for uh, for 
Oh, oh my gosh! Oh, what a high a risk, see. high reward strategy! Right, like you get the sleep in, but your teammate wakes him up. I've been there a million times oh. for myself. Yeah, I mean, you talk about how you played a bunch of Lucio. I obviously, I mean, obviously you flex over to the other supports, yeah. and you know, Iona here really playing just incredibly aggressive for this first defensive hold burned I love off. That. Look at all the time already burned yep. off of yep. the clock for Maris. Maris now forced to engage. They're, they know they have to try and push into this point, okay? Slowly moving their way over. They have Facebook on that far edge, trying to keep that cover damage above. And it's going to be the Ant Matrix from Iona in the back. Doesn't matter. Maris goes ahead, unloads the rocket barrage, and they're going to take the first point. Yeah, so uh, that's got to feel good for Maris, right? Like Facebook is getting this one in there. They just saw die do the same exact thing essentially with a junk rat tire obviously a little <laughs> bit higher to have that or harder excuse me to, to have that done right uh the tire has health in itself it's gotta go forth you have to control it with the junk rat that is completely vulnerable at that point now you speak right. on vulnerability yes that is your fair up top while she's actually pulling that ultimate but start talking about other heels and shields and whatnot and now that's more of an ideal situation not the Majin? same with that jump rat tire fight on the last point swaffles take it away Majin went down early in that fight but it looks like it's not going to matter iona managing to handle mares throwing in but with three kills coming through, it could be anyone's game. The sound barrier is popped to keep everyone on Iona in this fight a little bit longer, but this is another barrage. Uh, it's devastating as Maris is continuing to just aggress and push forward. Iona wants to burn this clock as much as they can. Here's another tire. Is it gonna be a kicker? There it is, a kick an emerald back to the spawn. Does go ahead and grab the DMEC on top of it and oh, pin what? Like, what? spawn. Oblivion oh drops the shatter and that is going to seal the deal for a great defense for Iona here on Anubis. Wow, yes, still more trickling, but... Yeah, another amazing charge. Oblivion, seriously, is taking one into that Shadow Realm. Two minutes, 40 seconds will be the time that Iona's going to be getting onto this next. Only two minutes was achieved from Maris coming into this last one. And uh, Sid, I got to say, there was a shift in momentum earlier on in this game. Yeah. I think that that is going to be <laughs> Iona able to continue on with that through and on in to Temple of Anubis. I'm calling it now. We're seeing a game four. So I think one of the most important things that Iona has given themselves in this round is a clear win condition, yes. right? Maris did not touch that second checkpoint at all. Ready. So Iona needs to get on that second point and they I, they only need one tick to win Anubis. We saw what happened on the first map and the real question is, are they going to be able to repeat history or is Maris going to be mm, better prepared and try and hold them here? Uh, I'll say, I doubt that we're going to see the same exact situation happen, right? Like, right. Sai has already shown us what they can do with this tire. Very skilled player. But Maris will simply be paying attention to this so much more. And even having a junker on the other side, even just showing a junker on the other side, might do enough for kind of like that misdirection play towards this beginning area. No, we're not going to see Maris switching off of players, like going all the way back for it. But it's that misdirection. It's kind of, you know, like in the mental games, right? Right. Absolutely. And well, with the shift in momentum, it has been a huge mental game for Marist in this most recent round. Iona now has the high ground and well, they're moving forward and moving straight onto this point. Krev has gone down early in the fight, but that hasn't stopped them before. Marist continuing to aggress forward and try and prevent Iona from moving on. A lot of stu stuns coming through onto Iona and uh, that's going to oh. be Marist holding strong here for this first point. Yeah, that was a decently late stagger as well. You look at this, right? We started with 2 minutes and 40 seconds. Uh, initial tanks drop decently early from Iona, and Maris does a good job of really lengthening out these kills. As it is, still looking another like couple seconds before this team, even with the Lucio speed boost, are going to be able to get back in here and try through the same way. May, wa May wall up front, and then May wall in the middle. <laughs> 
you're going nowhere until those walls are gone. And oh, a blizz, uh, the freeze comes through. Does it matter? Immortality field from Kreb has been committed. The Ant Matrix, though, is going to be a lot of pressure onto Iona. They respond in kind with their own and say, Marist, if you want to take this sight line, let's play. Both teams, though, waiting. Just want to wait it out. No one wants to risk too much. Shatter was canceled in the middle because of that pin from Oblivion. Absolutely massive cancel coming through. He's got a shatter of his own. Drops two people on the ground. Vocal tries to oh. save everyone, but there is a blizzard eaten in the process from Calamity. Maris does not want to give oh. up. Sigigi absolutely repeating history of this first map with another 3k <laughs> tire kill to win this fight for them. Sai guy, who else but Sai guy? I all shall fall before the junk rat tire here, Waffles. Love to see it. Love to see it. I don't believe this is a Marist College squad that's going to be able to get this one. No, they shall no, not. No, no. Now, they're not going to have the same momentum here. That's the big difference right. between Iona's push on this one and this uh, and the previous game, and the previous uh, uh, offensive push in regular time. Calamity going back on over to the May now. I love to see this. There's only less than one minute left on the clock, so Iona knows they have to, you know, maybe farm a little bit of resources, have a couple seconds to do so. They pushed in, there it is, Blizzard from Facement so is going to be tough, freezing up a lot of people. But six people are not frozen in that Blizzard tugboat! Wow. Wow. wow! What a Blizzard and a clutch one from Facement! There's still 30 seconds Staggered. left on the clock, and with Majin on the Lucio, Iona is going to be able to come back and have one last chance oh, here stagger. before the end. Next, or Sam X is still not dead. There to the end, they have that. But this is 15 seconds left, and an Iona College squad that's going to have to fight this one with five here, Waffles. 10 seconds left on the board. There's an Earth Shatter online. I don't know if Iona can even touch if they get stunned before they can, before it's over, right? Uh, there it is. Earth Shatter's gonna take gonna down touch. a Kraven. Yes, there is a touch here in the back from Majin. There's a few people from Iona holding down the fort and trying to keep their dream alive. Self-Destruct comes in from the main line there and it's gonna zone even more people out from Maris. Iona knows this is match point for them and they need to win this if they want to yeah. stay in this fight. A second barrier from Maersk may be what they need to seal the deal in the coffin. Two kills from this tire. Are we even surprised anymore by that value? And Iona still trying everything they can to stay in this fight. Maersk has triggered the overtime bar, but it's just a couple people left. Says is swinging his heart out on this Reinhardt left and right. Shifts are there. Oh, so is anyone from touching a follow up pin is going to happen? And Maersk still continuing to hold this defensive Ew. point. Iona is not giving up though. Still a couple kills from Oblivion. Just trying to bring that last bit of value in. In the end, it's going to be a draw. I'd love to see it. Love to see wow. it. So no point here for Iona, but they still hold strong and still keep their playoff dreams alive. This was your typical top eight single elimination bracket. And now we got wow. our last two teams. <laughs> They're now going to be looking at a little bit extra Overwatch action here, Waffles. Love to see it. Oh. Sigh all day long. We're asking about MVP nominations. We're not done with this competition yet. But I know where my initial vote goes to. <laughs> My and, oh my. you know, maybe not, if he doesn't get the MVP, he should at least get honorable mention for having a great clutch factor for his team. Uh, not one. once, but yeah, <laughs> right? Man, three tires uh, with only, unfortunately, only two for the last tire, <laughs> not his normal three. Well, and it was a Diva <laughs> Mech too, so you can look at like two and a half or whatever, right? Totally, I get, uh, yes. <laughs> you know, three three tires. You basically got a full car on that one, right? You need, you need one more and, you yeah. know, and, a, and a and a wheel and an engine. You got to you got a point A to point B. There you go. Little hearts and harps, dabs and pounds for the Iona Esports squad. Love to see yeah. it, dude. Love to see it. Maris wow. will have priority since they won this last map. Not the, not the not Temple of Anubis, of course. Map before then, that was Ike and here. Right. That was a decently faster one. Didn't even quite get out of that first point right here. But it's going to be Iona. It's going to excuse me. Going to be Maris College picking map for the fourth. And again, guys, just in case you are newer to Overwatch, whatever else like that, this was a draw in the previous. What that means, of course. Is we're, uh, within an Overwatch, we do not play best ofs, we play first twos because the draws are possible. That draw yielded both teams zero points. 
they just played some Overwatch, they played the 2CP, but neither team got any match points for that. We are still looking at a 2-0 lead for Maris. So you say it yielded no points for either team, but I think the more important thing is that it yielded a massive amount of momentum for Iona. Um, obviously, you know, came back to be able to tie that there for Anubis and, you know, they had their backs up against the wall. Maris was at match point looking to try and take this win, close it out here on Anubis. And uh, Iona really went ahead and brought the fire back and stood their ground. This is exactly what you said you wanted to see from them holding their line. We're not... We're we're not asking people to just shut down at the first point defensively mm -hmm. and play 100% perfect, right? That's where, I mean, that's not even realistic, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. these people, these players have been doing fantastic and I'm really excited to see where we go for our next map. I, and, uh, you know, if that's going to- I think I saw to... Kings Row. Oh, is that what we saw I here? I think I saw Kings Row on the, uh, on the player's screens right there. Oh. <laughs> favorite there would be no surprise whatsoever right, right, right. there i mean I, I love king's row you love king's row love cast and love playing on it obviously these players like playing on it uh it, it is one of the more well-rounded and well like least controversial maps within the within the uh, game i believe there's a lot of oh, no, uh, showing... cover fire cover okay, fire and it looks like we're getting a preview of rialto instead rialto. Rialto. all right i do love rialto I um, think this could be, I mean, this doesn't surprise me too much from Maerst because mm -hmm. they have some sharp shooters, okay? Cloud is subbing back in for <laughs> Emerald, but in general, just absolutely just deadly coming mm -hmm. up. And that is a long sightline opening from the initial spawn for the aggressors. Yeah, we'll see how this one goes. I gotta say, you know, I can waltz waffles we have a little bit of boop capabilities obviously there's nothing temple of anubis wise oasis it's got the capabilities there i think we actually did technically see a single boop but really not something the the maps are known for right rialto Two bridges point here. One, this bridge yes exactly. and the first bridge the, the first one really is more so I, I mean main bridge is what i'm saying like where payload needs to come across from that more so than the than the side bridge the side bridge is more for surprises like so the surprise boops and whatnot the main bridge is more for coordinated heal uh, co coordinated attacks when it comes to those environmental kills aka tays on the wrist in those points. yeah and then i mean yeah there's there's this other main bridge here right out of spawn, right? There's two bridges that the payload has to move over. And uh, well, those are two drop zones. And we see that there's the Orisas online as well, right? Going to be opportunities for people to get pulled off to the side. Calamity set up on this bastion. So a bit of a pirate ship that we uh, are seeing roll out here on the Rialto map. And, I, I'm not surprised. Oh my gosh, so much damage coming through. I talked about uh, this damage on the Bastion earlier that we saw from Maris, oh and instead God. Iona has gone ahead and pulled it out themselves. Not surprised. Not surprised. That's definitely why they wanted to play first on here. This is not the first time the pirate ship would, <laughs> has been played. And, and this is right. a classic, you know, not one but two shields up top. Uh, I might. I mean, the, the classic would be like 276 capabilities. Doesn't matter. Side group playing a fantastic junk rat so far. And all oh, shall oh, fall. Dude, this is. Oh my god. This is just going to Wow. Yeah, but it's Maris. Maris came through, was able to encircle Iona, get around the shields, put the damage down, and once Calamity was dethroned, they just went ahead and retook the payload. Uh, here they go. Thank you. Thank you. I was, I was hearing myself a little bit too much there, guys. Iona College now dropped a lot of ultimates on this previous to try and keep that dream alive. Not gonna matter. A Bob on board. We might see the seven stick action here for a little bit as Cloud will send that one out here soon. Main support completed. Not a great way to start this one for Maris. And there's a Bob thrown from Maris on top of it. So it's gonna feel like you're playing more of a seven on six pushing into this fight with uh, Iona. Gonna have to reset and, well, thankfully they do have Amplification Matrix coming up online to engage with. Yeah, and. Again, that combination of those ultimates, I said it earlier, Iona seems to be more of that solo play. Krev putting out these amplification matrixes and whatnot, obviously everybody's going to be answering to these, but if I think about the 
biggest ultimates for Iona, those have been your Psy uh, Tires, those have been your Calamity right. Blizzards. These are very, very slow low ultimates, and everybody else either wants to spare, then they can try and come forth and get something going of their own. Oh, you in with wow. Transcendence out first, and just like that, Calamity, Grev, and Najin down. Iona's College's just push is over. <laughs> well, Ohm did a really good job at popping that trance to, number one, keep himself alive and also enable more aggression from his team to be able to just capitalize on those players on Iona. Um, they were a little bit sectioned out here at the front and, well, couldn't quite pop the ultimates they wanted to engage. Now there are a lot more online and, well, there's win conditions for both teams, so it's going to be about who can really gain that advantage and Maersk just put in the work in, putting so much damage before Iona can even walk up towards the payload and, holy cow, it is a tough mm. battle for Iona here with Maersk just hard bunkered on the high ground and with super charger online yeah look at this and, and again I, i'm not saying that the diva for iona is a bad pick but when this is amex and called out in the end consistently that was like three times in a row there for the temple of anubis like the very very end of that first amex and that eight into time these are simply engagements that you can't allow have happen fighting a five to six with no diva are you serious these are not ideal situations and never a time that iona is going to come forth and take advantage from you know th there's no such thing as like a reinforcement late that's going to help like that you know right and uh you know iona here moving around at the side to really try and push mares off the top the blizzard is going to clear a lot of area and slow people up but a couple kills all coming through here for Iona. They know they need to try and move this payload, but time is running out and they are running out of players. The self-destruct on the payload is going to clear them oh. for a moment. Basement what? gets kicked or gets clipped there in the back in the process, but it is still Iona here with a couple men down. They do have a bit of a spawn advantage, but the OT bar has triggered. Maersk wants to hold this defensive line as much as they can, and with the removal of Calamity there at the end, it is going to look like Maersk holding strong and going to stop this payload before the first checkpoint. Yeah, so Majid gets a little barrier action there at the end. Minor bit of minor bit of like Lucio tech, right? If instead he had taken this off the top and then jumped from, you know, uh, ran up this the right side of this, then jumped off a of corner to actually go forth. He could have been able to get the horizontal boost in speed as well as the quick up to down with that sound barrier. Now this is one player fighting one to six. This is not something that he was going to be able to go forth and kill six players. Woo! But again, some minor yeah. tech that you guys can take with you. Hey, there you go. We are getting absolutely amped in the Showboat yeah. Hotel, the picturesque Atlantic City Boardwalk. Love to see it, guys. Love to see it. Well, we are here on Grand Finals Day, and it's not just Overwatch Grand Finals. It battle. is Grand Finals of... We saw Super Smash earlier. We got League of Legends later. It is all day here at this channel and i gotta say i am so thrilled to see the variety of games coming through it's not always often you see multiple games from different orgs sometimes they just specialize and everyone's really getting their chance to shine here i 100 100 the uh the, the the agree on that one they're being sneaky wobbles they're being secretive and quiet nobody can tell that they're there <laughs> Which was really successful on Anubis too, right? Really fast aggression right out of the gate. Pretty much just uh, stomped on Maris before they had a chance to take a breath outside of the spawn door. This time though, there's a lot more space to work with and a nice spin. spin comes across. Oblivion's pins are insane. I do not ever make that many pins and Wait. man, they are continuing to try oh, and push man. forward. Maristel knows what the name oh, of the man. game is. They just keep pushing oh, this payload and oh, Iona's <laughs> defense crumbled in the back and now they have got to regroup fast to hold this last defensive line. Th that's the only big issue with coming in from the smaller bridge area. That happens right there. You get a wall up between the two of you, the AKA Taze is projected barrier, and you've just purchased yourself a lot of free yardage. And that is yes. space time that Iona cannot give up. We are looking about 18, 20 meters away as this uh, payload is barely going to interrupt whatsoever. Just like that, 
Fan Max dedicating the life to stop this one for a few seconds, but three minutes is a long time here, Waffles. It is, it is a long time, and Calamity has gone down early in this fight. Really nice job coming through from the bloodthirsty support line of Mares. Mm. They're continuing to try and keep their team in this fight, and a pull spot is going to oh, take two! Man. Oh, that is crippling for Iona as Facement yep. continues to just pop off one after another, hitting those headshots there on the baby diva, and that is going to be Maris just doing a great performance and taking yep. this map of Rialto and welcome to our grand finals of Maris College. There you go, your MAC champions here Woo! coming on in to Atlantic City, getting it done. That is Cloud, that is Facebook, that is Tayus Trader, yeah. Southern Pet, OUM, Vocal, Emerald, everybody here. And there's the band club. Love to see it, fellas. Love to see it. Yeah, fellas, oh. ladies, everybody in between, our non buyer binary folk, everybody here. For all, all the peeps. Red Foxes on top. <laughs> all everybody. Everybody is happy for uh, that And one. look at those gotta... smiles on those players' faces. They are so thrilled and excited to be the champions there at the Showboat Hotel. Uh, I bet you the energy is just off the hooks for them, and I am so excited for them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, show it off in the Showboat Hotel. Some fantastic stuff. Hey, sportsmanship as well. Sportsmanship as hey. well. Love to see it. You Absolutely. know, maybe, maybe you, you do play a lot of uh, Sigma there, traders and Tays. But hey, at least you're at least they got the sportsman like conduct <laughs> coming on in to this one. And, and yeah. I joke, of course. Uh, I, I guess I would poke fingers at the maid players before pouring the Sigmas and whatnot. <laughs> but hey, undying glory and honor coming on through here for your Maris University Red Foxes. That is Absolutely. what they've gotten here in first. Iona College not going to be going home with tail between their legs here, Waffles. Still no. a fantastic effort and great job getting on in to the second place and mm -hmm. uh, and still pushing Maris to extra extra maps as well. Oh, right? yeah. They did not take any points, but they did not give up three maps in a row. They uh, definitely gave Marist a moment of a stutter on Anubis. And, uh, you know, both of these teams are actually going to be at the Overwatch EGF National Championships. Oh, yes. So there could be an opportunity to see them face off again down the road and uh, see if history does or doesn't repeat itself. But mm -hmm. today it is going to be Marist walking away victorious as our Spring Grand Finals champions. All right. Oh, yes. Oh yes, again, undying glory and more going on in for the first place. But that is going to be about it here for the MAC Championships at the picturesque Showboat Hotel in Atlantic City. This has been Overwatch. We've got plenty more esports action coming at you, folks. Tomorrow will mostly be used for travel days for these collegiate teams, but today ain't done yet. I'm FBI Tugboat. He's been casting with waffles over here. I've had a fantastic time. Ooh, Big shout too. out to Marist. They got to flex a couple of their players. Big shout out to Emerald and Vocal coming on in here. Uh, not sure if they're formal starters. Not sure if they're formal okay. bench players. Doesn't matter. They still got a lot done on in here. Anything else before we tell the good people uh, do? And thank you for watching, this, Waffles. Anything else? Uh, you know, once again, thank you all for joining us. Talk about so good to work with you and. I want to give huge props to the production team there Please. and behind the scenes. They're the ones bringing the real magic and uh, couldn't have done it without them. So, folks, thanks for joining us and uh, enjoy those League of Legends finals coming up.
Hello and welcome gamers, we return to the MAC Esports Championship to finalize the day with League of Legends, but more importantly, to conclude the final chapter of this Mace Esports Championship 3-day weekend event. I am your caster Rich right here, with an amazing co-caster to be alongside me for this League of Legends segment, MXL, who we will have with me uh, to go into this game. It is a best of three, it has been a spectacular day of gaming where we've seen titles and glory already been handed out but league of legends is the last segment that we're going to be doing today and again i can tell you i cannot wait it is an absolute pleasure to be here presenting this opportunity in the final moments again this chapter that i think we've all been waiting for and i know these gamers have been as well and we've got so much league of legends action coming up for us to really conclude and we do have two specific teams that we're going to be talking about that have worked their way all the way into these final stages again that is going to be marist versus manhattan who have been the talks of this whole time and uh, i think we actually do have my co-caster there we go mxl welcome my friend now that we've got a side by side here how you doing i hope you're excited for this amazing this amazing finale that we've got in front of us yeah doing fairly all right apologies for the cat in the background unfortunately uh <laughs> some things just happened but producer whispering might you to show the cat we'll get him on uh, eventually but very excited to see the games today uh, Marist versus Manhattan the two titans of the division of course coming in and Marist already coming off the backs of an overwatch championship just recently a very convincing 3-0 win over Iona who had a stellar third map actually like if you didn't watch that go watch that that was an insane <laughs> game uh, earlier today as well smash coming down to the very last stock in Quinnipiac versus Sienna just a very very solid set of games today hoping league is similar it's going to be such a an exciting set of games to say the least and you can already see the lovely uh the energy there at the desk with everyone at their pcs we've got some lovely plushies there as well even the face paint we talked about this yesterday with our other casters and just the team spirit going into this they've got everything to go and fight for here manhattan esports on cam right now they've got grins on their faces ready for the energy that we are going to be bringing into this and casting and as we talked about here towards the beginning of this this is the final moment so this is a best of three between these two teams we got a little bit of flavor from them yesterday but we also have to talk a little bit about the history leading up to this moment and what they've gone through most specifically at the fact that we've never really seen marist red foxes drop a game ever over the course of the season yeah marist has just looked absolutely dominant even in the games yesterday we saw just pulling out the fizz a champion that i have not seen a ton of as of late loving the heart loving every little <laughs> facet of the, the the love that marist is showing us here on the stream but they've pulled out some interesting picks they've worked very very well as a unit and i'm excited to see what's going to happen the only team that manhattan has lost to has been this marist squad and it was a 2-0 score line in favor of Marist the last time they fought. I think uh, Manhattan looking for a little bit of the upset tonight. Mm -hmm. And I just also want to piggyback off of just the excitement being on stage here. I know we're getting into the picks and bands, but to see all these gamers here in person, having the environment and that energy changes things significantly. I mean, it's one thing when you're playing from your dorm room or from a local campus arena, but to be here on the main stage, to be able to perform and demonstrate your capabilities as a gamer with your team, this is also a little bit of nerve wracking in seeing how these teams are going to play on this main stage going into this grand finals moment. Ooh, and something interesting here. It looks like Manhattan going to be stealing away the Lux. This is one of the big things in my notes from this game yeah. I was looking at. Nate the Great, basically just a Lux main, so much time on that champion. So not too surprised to see that being prioritized at all in the draft. Interested to see the Zeri still being banned even after some of the nerfs. And Jinx going to be banned away. This is something that I was also expecting to see Maris just constantly take off the table. Yeah, and I mean, again, stealing away is this is where you've got that opportunity of looking at previous games from yesterday and where you're being able to really read your opponent. And because you have that tactical strategy, the coaches, I guarantee you, doing their research going into this, we can see now the rest of the pickups coming through. We're actually going to get an Aatrox coming out here for Ooh. Manhattan to see what they can do on this top side, but also really looking at and emphasizing this J4 where that has a lot of hard engagement. I've seen it multiple times paired potentially with a Diana, which hasn't really been banned. No That's way. risen to power towards okay. it i've seen a couple of combinations but uh again just overall i'm at least liking so far what we've got 
from Manhattan, whereas we're going to see the completion with the poppy selection from Marist. Yeah, seeing some interesting stuff here, Marist and Manhattan uh, changing some picks around. But the big thing I noticed looking into the games from yesterday specifically, God sent picking up the Darius, picking up the Shen, specifically in the Darius game, looked pretty abusable, pretty weak. Had a pretty tough time up in the top side. I believe was getting dove pretty consistently in the early game. So the Aatrox worries me just a tiny bit, especially into something like the Gangplank, who's notoriously safe, does it extremely well uh, as the game progresses. I just, even last night, was casting another league and saw that GP just like doing 2k crits. It is ridiculous. Yeah the amount of damage he can pump out. You pair it with the Poppy, you pair it with the Rakan, that's a lot of engage, a lot of utility with that Steadfast Presence as well. Helps negate the Jarvan, negate the Aatrox, and it, it's looking rough already in the draft. As we do get the finalized bans coming through, Recognition no longer going to have the Fizz available on the table. Also, the Assassin elimination from that Talon play, not going to see that either. But the Ari has also yeah. been something in synergy with the Corky being eliminated from that mid lane because they're so oppressive. But we're going to get a Lucian lock in and haven't really seen as much of this recently. It's more so been the Aphilios. We've seen Jinx. We've seen Caitlyn. We've seen a lot of those priority picks. But, you know, Lucian does still have a lot of value going into this on the counter side, though you're going to see this ash and hover over the brom which again that beefy frontline engager that they can continue to just make sure that nothing's going to get through them with that said lucian and ash both receiving some pretty substantial buffs recently i think mm -hmm. just three days ago lucian getting a lot of buffs to that uh vigilance passive that was added to him to try and push him back into that bottom lane ash getting some buffs to uh her w as well if i remember correctly and Ash Braum is a terrifying lane to try and go against. No way. Okay, is it a Gangplank mid into the Lux? Cobra. This... No, I mean, we've we've seen some interesting strategies, though the strategies that we've seen that are a little bit more uh, unique have been on the opposing side of these big names of the colleges. So I'm curious to see if they're going to opt to do the same thing, because again, it's a best of three. So they have a chance now to potentially throw a little bit of a wrench into the mix. They can play a little bit more off the cuff here for this first game to really feel out their opponent before going back to something that they're more comfortable with, the structure that we've seen yesterday and previously throughout the season. Season. And I'm curious if that's maybe the mentality that they've got going into this to try and compete against, you know, a, a team at which that they've never really had to worry too much about because they've always managed to take the win and never, as we mentioned earlier, drop a game as a whole. Yeah, definitely, especially in the first game of the best of three, you can always look to pull out some more spicy picks, see if you can get away with a little more than otherwise would be possible. Uh, and, and, you know, if it goes south, you still have two games left, right? There's always that potential for that reverse sweep. I'm interested to see, I, I kind of expected the Lux to go mid. I was expecting to see a little bit more spice coming out from the Marist mid laner. Uh, last last night just played, what was it? Uh, I have it in my notes here too. Actually played Fizz, played yeah. the Yone as it well. Fizz like and then something Yone. really aggressive. Mm -hmm. Totally was expecting something along those lines, but uh, the Fizz was banned away. The uh, Talon bend away as well. So two of those assassins that can really just shut down the Luxon lane, taken off the table. Malphite was a little weird, but still fits that build fairly all right. Well, and when we also just kind of talk about like the overarching play from these individuals, Marist, you know, coming out as that dominant force that we've seen consistently throughout the season and in these playoffs and now into the grand finals, they've always really been clean from start to finish. Definitely when we talk about the second game yesterday in their semifinals matchup, they were so much more refined. Their synergy that they had was really, really clean. And and again, there was a big comment that you even made when we were looking at some of the VOD reviews is just that synergy between Rando Main and Cobra. Their understanding yes. and this ebb and flow between the two of them and how they're able to work through their lane and also just be able to understand where their strengths are to take that you know, counter position, or even if they were the ones that, let's say, didn't initiate an engagement or a gank, they've always been the ones to be so responsive and reactive to turn it around in their favor, regardless of an outcome that you would think wouldn't rightfully go in their favor. Yeah, and even across the games that uh, Maris did end up playing yesterday, game two, they, they drafted an Ezreal Lux. That is the definition of we're not playing through bot lane at all uh, in mm -hmm. a lane. They take the Zac Fizz as the lane pairing in the second game, the Zac Yone in the first. 
it looked so oppressive, so dominating over the course of those two games. And I think if you're looking at the side of Marist, a lot of what they look to do is just going to be based around this jungle mid lane tandem. If they're able mm -hmm. to pop off, if they're able to start snowballing either themselves, the rest of the map, whatever it may be, Marist is a terrifying force to try and deal with. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other part, too, is, is they played with their second game being, of course, the one for those that might not have seen it yesterday, the one that was a lot more clean. It, it gave more agency to Nate on this Lux to play elsewhere because Ezreal has such a safe bottom position. Like you can really just leave Ezreal to their own devices. They have an evasion. They have an escape. They don't really have to be babysat nearly as much as we've seen in others. Like when you talk about an Aphilios, if you leave an Aphilios and there's some kind of heavy mobility, you're going to find yourself having a bad day. So in this case, with the you know composition that they've got going into it, it's going to be something I'm really curious to see how well they can play. But on the reverse side, when we talk about Manhattan, they've actually been more so of a team that can recover and adapt very well. Towards their earlier part of the games that had happened yesterday, they found themselves at the short end of the stick. They were behind. They were able to rectify a lot of that by getting objectives, finding more favorable encounters either towards that bottom half towards river by dragon objectives or even rotating to get dominance into other lane prio so there's been so much from them as well that i'm really curious over the course of the season and now going into these grand finals that they can continue to bolster to then have a real opportunity of as you and i even talked about maybe just taking a game away from marist yeah and that's something that uh you know marist we've never really seen on the back foot in terms of series right if they come in game two and they're already down zero one i'm interested to see how that will really impact them you mentioned a little bit weaker of an early game coming out from manhattan normally uh game one in particular yesterday just darius getting abused godsent did not have a fun time at all in that matchup uh no. but they did manage to turn it around off the back of the zillion karma pairing alongside the gin the poppy that they once uh was picked up on the opposite end but we are getting into game, and I'm beyond excited. Actually, oh, Godsent going for the Ignite as well. Such an aggressive decision coming out of the top lane. And as you can see, we do have Manhattan on the blue side with Marist on the red, as we are going to be seeing them enter to the line of scrimmage across the riverway and really just looking for the fireworks, the excitement between these two. I think we've actually got a little bit of a uh, pause here as we're looking to correct that tech issue but this is what we want to do we want to get you you know excited we're like yeah we're gonna go into game nope not just yet yeah. pause wait so we're only trying to boil this over because like we said this is the la this is the finale this is the finale for the day and for the event weekend so we are cannot imagine what type of energy is going to be put into this because these gamers also want to put on a show for not only themselves those that are tuning in but also for those there locally in the event space themselves yeah, I definitely agree. I think putting on a show is the name of the game here. We've got some interesting decisions coming out as well. Both top leaners opting into the Ignite. I'm extremely excited to see how this will play out. As uh, anyone who watches Ignite top laners in solo queue, in pro play, wherever, uh, that is incredibly aggressive. It is, makes any top lane incredibly volatile. And if you're able to get a lead off of that Ignite, it can be so, so hard to shut that champion back down. Gangplank scales incredibly well. Aatrox with any sort of a lead. It's not going to be a fun time if you're the Lucian, to say the least. So very interested to see how that will play out. Although there's always the caveat of Predator Poppy, the Lucian Rakan pairing. So much damage that can come out from these three champions in particular. And Cobra opting into something a little more defensive than I think we were really expecting to see today with that Malphite mid. Could bully out the Lux early, but... Not sure how much kill threat there's going to be. It feels once again like it's going to be around that mid-jungle pairing. Mm -hmm. And as we again take a look at the positioning here for these junglers rotating from that bottom portion up towards the top half. Again, we're looking to see how they're going to engage. Will they look to network into this mid lane position, which we've seen before? Or they're going to opt to maybe try and give that momentum in that top half. You talked about it earlier, the significance of Croissant on this gangplank. The crit value can be so substantial if you get them into a great position. When uh, already going to be a little bit harassed here, does have the opportunity of getting some more range poke. Hyper aggression comes through. In God spent over the wall. First blood comes out. Croissant is eliminated, so it is a one for one trade, but you still get that extra little oomph for the first blood going in favor of Croissant. Oh, Woo, and, and there's even a road. Okay. This we talked about excitement and fireworks. 
literally not even three minutes into game, friends. <laughs> yeah. And this is the, the the issue with some of these top lane t uh, ignites. Instead of opting for that teleport, we see Godsent now stuck walking back to this wave. Not in necessarily the greatest spot. Granted, Stefo able to hold it, so won't be the end of the world up there. But Gangplank getting the kill and effectively the one v two. Sure, Stefo picks up the return trade. Has to burn the flash to do so. Double sums out of the GP. Sure, but now uh, Randoman. Just able to shut down the Lux, catching her on the over position, and now just abusing Stefo in the jungle. I mean, look at how aggressive you're just seeing this positioning coming out from Maris. They are making sure to put a statement out there in how they want to play this grand final. Stefo getting solo, a flash comes in, great one-for-one -one trade, but now, as we do look, the health values are a little bit more favoring oh, for the moment, but one-for-one -one again. But actually, Godsend is going to get out of this. A redirect from Cobra, trying to see if they can get some damage onto the Lux. But the Lux is getting the better end of this. And Godspent is there to support just in case, making it now a 3-3 three to three score line. Yeah, really, really close. Really tense fight. But Maris just overstepping a tiny bit too much. A beautiful bind coming out from the mid laner of Manhattan. And just doing so, so much work. Aatrox limping away at single digit HP, but Godsent doesn't care. Comes out, only three assists on the Aatrox, sure, but feeling so much better about the way that this early game is going to be playing out. And meanwhile, in bot lane, we've just seen typical exchange. It almost feels like it's where you want to leave a lane alone in top. That's what's happening in bot lane. They're just having a they're just having a good time. Shoved a little bit here in favor, you know, of Maris, where they're gonna have to play a little careful since it is an opportunity of having like a slow push towards MCJ in a return. And honestly, right now, I'm really, really curious to see how Cobra is going to start influencing once they hit six with this unstoppable force and their attempt to try and roam it after and look for additional crowd controlling as we just really take a little bit more of a slower, paused pacing here as we transition after quite a number of takedowns. Yeah, uh, interesting to note as well, Malphite not normally known for a lot of early aggression. You mentioned has to tend to be playing around that level six point. So to see Cobra already playing around the map, roaming with the jungler really says a lot about what this mid jungle pairing for Maris looks to do. Oh, the grand entrance just barely missing here. Are we going to be able to get the collapse onto this? Trying to come down. Stefo is there. Gets the flag and drag into the back. Has to force the flash. Nate still being very cautious. Does it need to force the flash here? And holds onto that. Both summoners have been used by wheels. So at least they've gotten something if Stefo wants to try and return for a second engagement. Yeah, a little bit of a misplay, I think, coming out from Stefo as well. The stun coming out from the Braum onto the Lucian. The flag and drag just goes a little wide, and unfortunately, that does just let Wheels take the flash and the heal out. Now, Godsent and Bandit fighting up in topside. Godsent actually in a good position, getting a lot of damage at the start, but unfortunately, Croissant should be able to get this. Closing the gap, dash. Parlay? Umbral maybe going to be able to do Whoa. so. No, doesn't get it. And Godsent just barely escaping with their life as the movement speed comes in swiftly, knocks them into the wall. There is an easy pickup potentially, but Stefo is there to help and bring the health value so low. Doesn't have the ability to drag forward to get the melee onto Rando main. So both come out again with no takedowns. Yeah, really, really close fight. I think, again, Stefo just using that Q, trying to get just a tiny bit more damage. Thought it would be enough. Oh. <laughs> so close. Beautiful. But yet so far. <laughs> now That's... we just take a, a pulse of this. Yep. And honestly... Again, it's. It, I feel like it's going to be these peaks and valleys. It really is in these early stages of the game. And it's because Marist has been more of the one to try and lead the aggression on every front. Top lane, mid lane. And the only real opportunity to counter it is in this bot half from Manhattan. Yeah, and you mentioned it. The counterplay is in the bot side, but Marist already looked a little eagerly towards that Drake, I would say. Darwin's still in the area, granted does want to be taking a reset now, so we'll have to see what what's going to happen. I think the vision control coming out from Manhattan around the strike, though, should signal a lot of pressure that Manhattan's going to be looking to put on this neutral objective. I think Maris has the potential to look, but with Poppy starting to path up towards the top side, her focus more than likely is going to be on this Aatrox, and we will more than likely see Stefo look for the repeat gank bot straight into that Drake at this around eight and a half minute mark.
I mean, especially since you've got both summoners down. Again, the heal and the flash were expended by wheels, so they've got the chance to collapse on it. But the only good thing is, is that you at least still have the flash available if Nate wants to go for potential engagement or has the ability to escape out if they have to use themselves as more of the shield to prevent that engagement. But you were mentioning how the rotation was going to come out from Rando up top, but has actually opted to go into this bottom position. They've spotted them out, not really from the vision, but just because they postured a little bit too forward. And you had Manhattan with full visibility on it. Yeah, Randall oh, Man's coming back, though. Going back in, there's going to be that aggression forward. Grand Entrance can't really get too much. You've got the flash out defensively, trying to see if the Braum position can escape. Does so, and with, since Steffo is down below, that gives them a chance to recover and allow Maris to just draw back and not look for any further aggression. Yeah, initially, Jason Woods with that hawk shot, able to spot out Randall Main, trying to look for a little cheeky gank bot side. After the hawk shot is burned, the poppy starts running away. All of a sudden, Ash Brom think they're safe, and Randomane says, no, 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 I'm just going to walk right back at you. Comes back in, forces out so many summoners from the bot lane of Manhattan, and now that completely flips the way the tempo is playing, as Marist is going to be able to pick themselves up this Infernal Drake first of the game and of the series here today. Aggression comes through, attempted to try and harass Croissant, but once again, Godsent getting the very, very short end of the stick here. Flash comes through, double no flash, actually. Double turn, are they going to get it? The health pot is just enough to keep Croissant alive, and that's why you use health pots, friends. It's exactly why you use health pots. Yeah, a little bit of a mis-execution from Croissant up in the top side as well, but Cobra's oh, here. no. Yeah. Unstoppable force comes out from the backside. Attempt, you can even see some... uh. Extreme focus. There's no celebration here. Maris just says, we want this. We've got this. We don't need to worry. There's a cataclysm from Steppo into the bridgeway. Nice stun into the structure that was put up by Steppo. Rotation from the top position. Lux also going to give that binding in the back, but doesn't get Rando main. Has to backpedal. The flag and drag goes wide. You've got a collapse now coming through, but beautiful crystal arrow from the bot to buy a few seconds. Is there a chance to get the return? The heal is there and can't seem to get both of them. Oh my, this is exciting. Yeah, again, Stefo just barely missing out on that flag and drag could have turned the fight completely in the favor of Manhattan, but Maris just playing on a knife's edge and coming out on top time after time after time, and oh my lord, Cobra has a lost chapter. It's going to be AP Malphite mid lane. This is ridiculously exciting for the opening game of this series. And this is what I think we all wanted. Let's be honest. I think this is what we've been looking forward to because you commented earlier on the other game titles and it was just a day worth of fun. And this is only continuing to, to bring more joy to us as casters and to those that I think they're tuning in. Yeah, I mean, I was not ready for AP Malphite. AP Malphite is <laughs> not in my prep notes anywhere, but very excited nonetheless to see it. And I think this fits Cobra's style just a little bit more. We talked about earlier the aggressive nature of some of the other picks we saw during the games yesterday like that fizz the more assassin focused champions especially when you're into such an immobile mage like the lux i think that has Ooh. a decent impact great read here oh coming gosh. out had the wards by raptor so stefo takes full advantage of it and now is going to rotate up to this top objective well, actually looking to try and just get it out a little bit and we'll be able to secure this and there's not really anybody that can test it because even if you do have croissant rotate to try and compete there is god sent there to assist despite them being a little bit down in exchange against this three two and one croissant bandit yeah and this is the nature again of that ignite top lane volatility croissant just continuing to get these advantages now it's sitting Comfortably, three kills ahead, down two assists, sure, but when you already have that three kill advantage, now a 25 CS lead as well, there is just so much gold that's pumped into this gang plank, and it's going to be so hard to really shut him back down. Harold dropped top, but there looks to be a fight coming out bot. Yeah, Rando, Main, and Nate primed and ready. The second that CS goes down, and if they push forward, there it is. Grand entrance. The crystal goes wide. The arrow swings past as the flash comes through. Bazon has to allow their comrade to fall and just look to tuck tail and run. Yeah, unfortunate there. No flash on the Ash, so she was just going to be doomed to fall. Good flash coming out from Nate as well, just to make sure that you're locking her down. And a good punish, honestly, coming out from Marist, I think. Punishing the overstep, the overaggression from Jason Woods and Bazin Josh, just wanting to 
try and push that wave and get themselves a reset, but Croissant's on trouble here. Cataclysm gives a little bit of separation on the God Simp, but we'll be able to just it completely evade it. Go right in for the takedown. Now I'm going to just pop the World Ender to ensure that they've got it as Stefo rotates back to get into the jungle. And at this point, that's really what God Sent needs. And we talked about the Darius even yesterday, and you mentioned it where they had a hard time at the start. But if you can start getting value into God Sent and giving that gold and itemization and necessary play potential, it can be really, really dominant. Yeah, and the big thing here is the kill, the shutdown, goes over to Godsent on this Aatrox. Yeah. So much more gold in his pocket, and he's going to be able to play a little better. Keeper's Verdict. Rando. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, flash. coming in. Unstoppable force going to go shy. Comes in a little late. There's a nice melee and forces the flash themselves. Stefo comes in for an assistance. And you've got Adorezzo just sitting in the back saying, all right, friends, I'm going to look to get the lockdown as well. And there is some potential rotation, though. Croissant comes in. They've dropped their focus from Stefo and now goes for the mid laner. Adorezzo can't survive. Help values in favor with that mid laner. The AP starts to hurt, and the crit hurts even more. This croissant is buttered and ready for pushing. Yeah, and, you know, it looks like a really good fight coming out for Manhattan at the start of this. They just go a little too far, dive a little too deep, and it turns out that in the extended fight, it's just the 3v5. The Ash Arrow was thrown, didn't hit anybody. Aatrox pushing the top wave, Ash pushing the bot wave. So sure, the fight initially looked so good for Manhattan, but Maris doesn't care. They keep running the fight down. They will pick themselves up their second Drake of the game in that Mountain Drake, which is so, so potent. And sure, it's traded for that first turret top, but with Maris having the potential for this Hextech soul point coming up on the next Drake. It's just, it's so tough right now for Manhattan. And with the now Hex gates available, it gives a lot more mobility and positional advantage around those major objectives. Again, we do still have some time. The Rift Herald not up in any moment. The Dragon did just go down, so it's going to be a little bit more attention back onto the lanes and trying to maximize through the jungle. Adorezzo needs to be a little careful, though. This movement from Rando Main could be, again, overwhelming. Nice lockdown, at least, to prevent the follow-up. Stepo is there. Just, it's basically got to go fast right now in this poppy with an unstoppable force. Their attention is on to the Lux and can't seem no to way. get it. It's still going to be an illusion. Oh, okay. There's there's the GP coming in from the top, able to get the takedown. But now I think that you've got Marist aggressing far too forward, and they lose out in this, losing two versus the one here for MCJ. Yeah, Marist now being the ones to overaggress themselves. It looked like they were starting to get comfortable with their lead, but that just seems like they're getting a little too comfortable, to be quite honest with you. And you just don't need to force there. There's nothing you're fighting over. Even if you get those kills, there's not really a turret you're going to be able to get as a result. Neither neutral objective is available either. So it just feels like fighting for the sake of fighting. And they come out on the losing end of it, now sitting at just under a 2,000 gold deficit. Manhattan starting to come online at this mid game. As we reach this again, middle position, this mid game is going to be one to really keep an eye on because this could shift if you have Manhattan able to find value and really be able to basically outmatch this aggression. And they've been reading it very well. Their reactiveness to the heavy mobility and the unstoppable force from Cobra has been a lot more well read than we saw initially in the first couple engagements. And that's something that they really have to hold their hat on because, again, what we've seen. They've been playing behind against this team who has been the talk of this MAC championship and hoping that there is an opportunity to shut them down. Yeah, and I mean, it feels a little backwards for us, right? We were talking a little bit off air how Marist has been this team that's been very dominant in the wins that we've seen them have. And Manhattan's been the team that tends to be playing from behind. They tend to be the ones that are on the back foot in these early games. So to see the rules flipped a little bit, this is a position that I don't think Maris is necessarily too, too comfortable with, and that could be part of the reason Random Man looking for some of these fights in that bottom jungle. We'll have to see what's going to happen with that Hextech Drake now spawning in two minutes, Baron in two and a half. I'm expecting to see more focus towards that, uh, that Drake in particular, but there's a chance we see a play around that Rift Herald. A lot of members of Manhattan playing up towards that top side.
Yeah, I was going to comment on that as well. The Vision's also heavily placed in the river position, knowing that that Rift Herald is coming up in just a few seconds. You can see the timer just continuing to reduce there on the map, turning yellow. So they've prepped and readied themselves to get that objective to potentially break open either this bottom position with the tower or in the mid lane. Could even potentially continue to try and harass this top side. But now you're going to see Jason, unfortunately, being collapsed on three versus one. Oh. Nice flash evasion gets the crystal arrow. But, I, I mean... Even though Jason didn't get much out of it, I still got to give him style points there in the bot lane when you're going against four like that as the Rip Tail goes down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really good flash, but it does result in the turret falling regardless. And there's an argument to be made. If you're just going to die anyway, take the Malphite ult, take the hit, save the summoners for a later fight. Won't have access to that cooldown for the next five minutes. Herald pop mid, though, so should be the trade of the mid tier one for that bot tier one, which I think Manhattan's gonna find favorable, that GP oh, damage. no! What aggression flashes forward! And that's where you're gonna have Krasaw Bandit getting, again, a little overzealous here. I think that's really going to be the biggest thing, is Marist, if they continue to play hyper-aggressive like this, they will be punished, but they're more than willing to take these types of stands. Yeah, but big thing to note here, the back canceled from the Jarvan means yeah. that this Drake is going to go over to Marist. There's almost no way that Manhattan will be able to contest it. So now this will put Marist onto their Ocean's, or sorry, Hextech Soul Point rather. There is no Ocean Drake in this one, but it's such a potent Drake. Now granted, with something like the Malphite, the Soul not necessarily too impactful, but super strong for Lucian. Jason Woods just spotting out the entirety of Marist with that Hawk shot, so won't be playing too aggressive, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a fight to be breaking out here. Croissant Bandit not quite set up yet, doesn't have the ultimate, so maybe Manhattan can look to try to force something here. I mean, they really can look to forfeit it since it isn't the Dragon Soul, as you mentioned, so they could look to just try and harass here to see. The, the blood continues to boil right now, and the intensity continues to rise as now Rando says go! Flashes forward, gets Jason locked down. Beautiful Fisher in the back from Bazon to try and slow their momentum, but isn't going to be able to block that much damage. The calling comes in, dwindling the health, has to flash out upwards as Godson has their eyes on Nate in the back, but can't seem to close the gap, and you have Mer dominating by this Drake and easily gonna clean up for the third. Yeah, Jason Woods just walking way too far forward. Walks up to try and negate the GP barrel, but unfortunately, Guts caught out as a result of it. Randomane pops the Predator, runs at this Ash, even flashes behind there to make sure there's no shot that this Ash is gonna be able to get out. And it's a huge fight win for Maris. They definitively will start taking control of this game, and they're Firmly set into the driver's seat. Drake's soul point now belongs to them. And, you know, in four and a half minutes, it's going to be rough. But Manhattan's going to have to try to shut that down. Yeah, we really have to. And, and again, I really liked the positioning when it came to the Glacial Fisher in the back line to try and draw their attention away, slow their momentum inside of that frost crevice and the fissure to see if they could potentially get some repositioning advantage but the damage was already done health bars were so low that you're just playing a recovery game and if you can continue to play this aggressive one of the strengths that maris is showing they will be able to continue taking this first game yeah and it looked really really good early on from manhattan this Lux just doing so much work in the early to mid game but now that we're starting to edge towards those later game fights Maris just coming back online saying, okay, yeah, we're still a team fight comp. We have this, oh my gosh, Luden's Shadow Flame Malphite. He is just looking to obliterate whoever he jumps on. And Lux cannot be pressing W ever in this game if you're playing yep. against Cobra, because uh, that just gives so much magic pen. It's like a soft int, basically, and it feels so bad because you want to shield your team. You want to try and prevent damage, but shielding just means Malphite's going to shred you even faster. And as we take visibility across this map, attempt to potentially get a lockdown in this mid lane position. Maris being a little bit more hesitant here. They're not playing as aggressive because they know they've got time. No major objectives on the map for the moment outside of Baron, which I don't really think they need to worry too much about because they're still finding value elsewhere. A little bit of harassment in this bottom lane, trying to get that tower again. Not really actually seeing any bounty objectives coming out either because really it's only a... Roughly 2k gold differential between it, even though Marist is finding such value in these 5v5 engagements. 
Yeah, I mean, the gold deficit definitely looking a lot closer than I think the scoreboard or even the map pressure would tell you. This river control for Manhattan as well, just signaling that they still are able to really step up, look to try and set up around these neutral objectives. And, you know, if they're able to have four people, five people around this Baron, Marist sure can look to try to take it. Neither team's Baron damage is great just to begin with, but any sort of a fight that breaks out can really swing either way as a result of the vision. Cobra, though, might have just found an Ash. Oh my goodness! Unstoppable. What a stun, though, does manage to cause some space between the two, and you've got Jason just barely getting out of there. Yeah, I mean, sure, Jason gets out, but you burned the Malphite ult, which has, like, at most a 60-second cooldown at this point, mm -hmm. for Ash flashing, healing, and ulting. And, yeah, her ult cooldown got reduced, so that's a pretty significant buff to her, but... Not having access to those two summoners is going to be massive going forward in this game, as that's where a lot of the damage from this Manhattan composition really stems from. Big focus here towards the mid lane to see what they can do. Still a little bit of a harass in the bottom position, since you do still have the TP available by Cobra, so they can continue to have this divided attention in the bottom position. And if they do harass and leave Jason here, that's going to be a five versus four, as they could rotate up in this position, looking for a flank even. Nice attempt here with the ultimate to try and dwindle some of the health from Adarezzo, but still really playing cautiously here and not actually going to opt for any solid engagement since this Dragon Soul is up in just over 60 seconds. Yeah, the Malphite ult available once again, so my eyes are going to be on Cobra, see how this is utilized, because this one ultimate can make or break how some fights play out, and if it hits four, it looks insane, if it hits zero, it looks super, super bad, we'll have to see which one we'll get, Cobra has been on point so far, GP Barrel not going to land there, but Manhattan needs to be able to contest this Drake, and they have no way to gain control over this river right now. No, they don't. It's going to be do or die. They have to take this fight, though, because they can't afford to really let this Dragon Soul go. But look at how forward Cobra's playing, just knowing that they can basically walk through here for free without any sort of concern of retaliation. And as the Drake oh, comes split. up in 30 seconds, yeah, they're divided here. This is not looking good. They can't really seem... There's no way they can even try and press forward because if Cobra just takes the decision, actually Crystal Arrow comes through, lots of stack damage, forces out the stasis and denies that engagement from the Black and Dragon. Oh, Cobra no. comes in with the unstoppable force in the back. Damage is just overflowing from Maris. They just completely bamboozle post the stasis. The Zonias allows just an opportunity for Cobra to come in and this now guarantees a Dragon Soul. Yeah, I really like the look coming out from Manhattan, but unfortunately, it's just not enough. The CC not lasting long enough. Cobra able to pop the stasis, able to stay alive. The light binding just a tad too early, and Cobra just does so much work. Dives onto the Ash, dives onto the Lux, finds the ult onto two, finds so much damage, just blows them both up. And sure, your J4, your Aatrox are in the backside, but they cannot do nearly enough. This Rakan, this... Lucian just doing so, so much work as well for Maris, and they're sitting strongly in the lead in this game. And now they draw their attention to the top half. They know that there is going to be a bat coming out for Maris. They have to spend the gold and itemization they've gained from that bottom position and the engagement. And at this point, attempted to try and drop some vision so that they at least could take a more favorable fight here by this Baron. And now that they've got it in sight, they're going to be able to easily eliminate any sort of intel that Maris has, but at this point, Maris can just really look to try and take engagements elsewhere. Again, they don't have to go strictly for this Baron because they've got so much already just in their back pocket. They've started to balloon no, this advantage again. now of 4K. And there's a second time around. Doesn't have the flash nor the heal, as you mentioned earlier. So Cobra will get this one. Oh, uh, Jason, I've been there. As an AD main, that feels <laughs> awful. <laughs> Guys, I don't know, this cooldown is so short, what am I supposed to do here? But Cobra might be getting caught here, Light Binding lands. Steffo gonna go in for Flash, Cataclysm, okay, and gonna have a Flash out. As you now have a chase okay. for the Rock, and you finally lay him to rest. But since there's so much attention in this bot lane onto Cobra, that leaves Baron right for the picking. It's only the support player. Josh is up top here, 
can't really do anything and they're going to easily collapse onto it. There's an assistance now with Godsent coming in, going to pop the World Ender to see if he can... Oh, actually, no, it's not even up and available for this. So they will just look to try and take the fight as they're down one. Crystal Arrow goes wide. The calling is blocked by Josh and blocking with the shield to keep the mid laner alive. Even with this concussion blow, it's still gonna get one lovely job from the mid laner to try and counter, but that flash should secure it. No, but Jason is here. Adorezzo is gonna get overwhelmed. The damage onto the back, there's not enough assistance and you're actually gonna have Manhattan come in with the exchange and take the advantage of this engagement. Yeah, Jason coming off the respawn shows back up, has the heal back available, so will keep the Lux alive as well, but a very, very big fight for Manhattan. Sure, Maris secures the Baron, but they get it on zero members. The Ace coming through, yeah. and I love the initial call. You're looking at the Baron, you say, okay, there's three people focused bot side. The Ash just fell as well. This should just be free, but this is what I was mentioning earlier in the game. Neither team really has that fast a Baron, so by the time it gets taken, the rest of Manhattan shows up. The fight just taken a little too aggressively, I think, for Marist. Could have looked to just back out, try to take the resets. You keep that Baron safe and utilize it going forward. But they look for the fight. They look for the play. And Manhattan comes up huge as a result of it. And now the next thing that they have to focus on is in 2 minutes and 40 seconds. That Elder Drake is the big objective. Again, with that execution, only further stacking onto four drakes for Maris could be the end of Manhattan. But if they can play just as they have before, reading this position and being able to get some early vision and advantage towards that dragon half of the map, they could look for another favorable encounter as they just had moments ago. Yeah, and this is the one downside to having taken such an early soul. The potential for the Elder Flame. Right? Smite is 900 damage no matter the level that change came through a little bit, uh, a w little while ago now at this point. Mm -hmm. But you end up being able to say, okay, if we're Manhattan, sure, they have the Hextech Soul, sure, we're down four Drakes. But you know what? There's always a chance. And if you're able to secure that Elder Drake, oh my lord, the, it's like a 20% execute threshold. It is yeah. so much damage, so much free damage, and yeah, it doesn't matter how tanky this Poppy or this Malphite is, if they just have strictly 20% less HP than what they would normally have otherwise. And because of the damage that has started to really escalate from Manhattan, there is a really great opportunity for a single pick potential. If you get that early numbers advantage, it can be so, so devastating. But the other side of it is, if you do have Maris managing to gain it, when you've got an unstoppable force pummeling, multiple members if they're in the radius getting them that low for an easy follow-up by either potentially the calling or even maybe just a hard crit from croissant that's also easily easily over of an engagement yeah we'll have to see final spark used early oh no they're gonna look for a flank onto jason in the back and woods goes down easy opportunity to collapse gets the double unstoppable force collapsing this was beautifully done in such a well-read positional advantage there was no vision in that bot half by raptors for manhattan to even suspect this position yeah just really good vision control coming out from maris as they will punish the overextension they will punish the usage of that final spark they're gonna take this tier two i don't think they'll look for the fight but Elder Drake spawning in 20, you're going to have uh, the Ash, you're going to have the Brom, Lux should have the ults available as well, but it almost feels like this Elder is just free for Marist going forward, and Stefo has to go for some sort of hero steal in order for this game to come anywhere close to in favor for... No way, the arrow! Oh, the arrow's going to land. Are they going to look to take this? They're still down a member. This is such a ballsy play forward. Stefo goes for the engagement and falls shy. Godsent doesn't have enough health value to turn this around. That was a Hail Mary of a play from Manhattan, and unfortunately, it's not going to yield them any value. As you've got Maris retaliating instantly, they had such a stellar, coordinated play. The composition in which they had, which we were curious to see how it was going to pan out, works out very well with Cobra, especially on this Malphite. And that allows them to take this first win so far and put them on match point for this conclusion of the League of Legends Championship. And look at the excitement. They know it. They're feeling good about it. Oh, yeah. And I would be, too, if I were in their shoes. A beautiful arrow coming out from Manhattan's AD carry, actually. Jason just pulling the trigger. Really liked the look. 
Unfortunately, it didn't quite seem to be enough. A really, 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 really good steadfast presence coming in from the Poppy, denying the Jarvan follow-up, and just so much work done there. Very excited to see what's going to happen going into the second game. Some of these highlights, like this Lux was just ridiculous. So much yeah. damage, but Croissant still coming up uh, huge on that. And there were a lot of plays that felt really back and forth across this game. I mean, that was probably where it was most close, honestly, the first 15 to 16 minutes. It started to pull away, of course, that we saw more so in Marist. And just this mobility and utility that all of Marist had in these engagements was so dominant. And also, the ability to just allow wheels in the back to have free reign. There was no ability to ever collapse on this ADC and had all the time in the world to do whatever they wanted. Yeah, it felt a little bad if your wheels on the Lucian there. Uh, at one point in this game, I believe I looked down and saw 0, 1, and 11. But the big thing that stuck out to me was, again, the jungle mid synergy from there is Cobra beautifully executing this Malphite. Every ult felt extremely impactful. Random main. Well, okay, right as I say it, Cobra get, getting done dirty on the replay. It's the but irony. It's the irony of, of the course. replay. <laughs> uh, random main, just beautiful timings on the Ws, negating what Stefa was looking to do, negating a lot of what Godsent would have been able to do. And sure, a throw here or there, such as that fight that broke out, but very well played as the game progressed from Marist, basically from oh, the Baron onward. And this was such that great read. No vision down below. They rotate through. They completely acknowledge it. Rando comes in for the CC and just allows Cobra to get enough damage area-wise and the two funnel into Wheels, who was just close there with the calling to give a follow-up as well. It was just so well done. And again, it's just that map presence and awareness that is also really something to highlight Marist for and what they've been able to take advantage of. They've always seemed to have this one-step-ahead positioning against Manhattan, but... As we say that, though, Manhattan does still have a fire within them. You can see it. They're focused. They're knowing that that was just game one, and they have to lay everything on the line as we're actually going to go lightning fast into our wow. next game. They are not wanting to wait. They do not want to let their hands settle, and they're going to come in quickly with this pick and ban phase. Yeah, definitely respect to this decision. I think uh feels pretty good at coming off of a win if you're Marist to just keep that momentum rolling. You know how it is in solo queue. You win a game, you just say queue up. We won the last one. Let's go again. Let's run it back. But uh, we'll be looking to just try and keep this momentum snowballing. Interesting to see the Darius ban as well, I think. Uh, last time around, we mentioned this earlier, Godsent didn't look too potent on the pick. But you know what? Completely makes sense. You're picking up the Gwen once again for yep. croissant and that is absolutely massive for the side of maris that's scary with what we've seen from croissant and just gwen as a whole if it is in the right hands it can be dominant as we do see the couple of selections Ooh. now coming out on the reverse size it is going to be a garen and a senna selected and this is something that we've not really seen over the course of this weekend yet so it is a little bit more of i think a flavor pick for them to try and put some kind of adaptation into their composition and their strengths yeah, and one of the strengths that Senna has is that you really can kind of pair her with anything. Uh, a few friends of mine will are notorious for playing things like the Senna Shaco, Senna Lilia, Senna Riven. Like, literally anything works when you pair it with a Senna. So I'm interested to see how that will pan out. Once again, the Lux going to be locked in, should be going to Nate the Great down there in the support role. And Godsent picking up the Garen for themselves more than likely. Granted, there is always the potential, like I mentioned, you're playing some sort of Senna Garen. Ooh. Wow. That is an Olaf. Okay. That is an Olaf. I mean, I have seen on repeated occasions and a lot of the collegiate scene what Olaf can really bring to the table. And some of the collegiate players that are able to really utilize Olaf. I mean, I've even seen it like an eight, nine minute marker, a nine, oh, and one Olaf. It's absolutely disturbing how well this Olaf can play. You can even see them knowing that they're confident in their picks coming through the Gwen, the Lux, the Olaf. This is going to be a mountain to climb here for Manhattan, especially being on the back foot. Yeah, I mean, Olaf, notoriously strong when paired with any sort of an enchanter. So there's even a chance, again, uh, it's Cobra, so probably not. But uh, there's always a chance of something like the Karma mid being paired with that champion, something that is incredibly potent. And if you ever start snowballing as random main on that pick, it is so, so hard to keep it down. However, 
Senna Seraphine is a very strong lane combination in itself. Yeah. So much sustain coming out from this pairing. So much poke damage. So much range as well. I'm going to be very interested to see how this matchup will pan out for both sides. Granted, Seraphine's still flexible to mid lane, but I'm anticipating that will be the bottom lane. I mean, my biggest concern is the value that we see a lot is also towards the late game aspect of it. I'm really curious to see what the other two are going to have online here for Manhattan, because if they're looking more towards this late game dynamic, how they want to play in the long run, I'm concerned because of how aggressive Marist has been playing that their early game dominance will be able to outmatch Manhattan, making this even more of a struggle for basically any sort of recovery. Yeah, definitely agree with you there. Steph are going to lock in the trundle there for themselves as well. Pretty decent answer into the Olaf. The one thing that Olaf tends to struggle against, uh, his ultimate does make him immune to all forms of crowd control, but mm -hmm. it does not make him immune to player-made terrain. The pillar is a pretty good source of that, not necessarily to the same level as the Anivia. Oh, no. No way. Talon's oh, going to slip through. Lord. We're going to see the assassin come out and how valuable that can be. This composition right now is is quite unbelievably oppressive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the one concern I have when it comes to these assassin mid laners is always going to be their potential if the game goes even, right? If you're not able to start doing work as Cobra on the talent pickup, it almost makes the talent not feel really worthwhile. It doesn't make it feel like it's going to be the pick that will win you this tournament. But you get one kill in lane, you get two kills in lane, all of a sudden that could completely warp what's going to happen. Cassiopeia going to be the response into it. And that is such a fun time in mid lane. Yeah, <laughs> fun time, fun time indeed. Uh, as we do get to take a look now at the overall composition, I mean... You do have the Olaf, which we talk about as being a frontliner with the Ragnarok, the ability to remove the crowd control, but it's not something as much as where you say like the Garen or potentially even the Trundle in some respects. So there is a lot more of this beefy engagement potential coming out from Manhattan. But I mean, just overall looking at this this composition between them, I'm I'm also really er curious to see how Nate is going to play being paired once again with the Ezreals. We did see that yesterday. That was something that we did have very, very good history on and can evaluate the way that they play. And it gained a lot of value whether or not Nate stayed with or not. And even just looking at the composition they ran with this Ezreal Lux pairing, they had the Fizz mid, this time around running the AD Assassin in the Talon instead, so mm -hmm. it still feels like a very similar composition. Granted, uh, it was the Viego Zac pairing instead of mm -hmm. the, I believe it's now, the Gwen top lane and the Olaf jungle, yes. so a little more mm -hmm. aggressive, a little more skirmishy there, I would say, but still running that same core uh, from the mm -hmm. looks of it, so interested to see how Nate will be able to roam around the map with that Lux pick, and how effective that really will be as the game progresses. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, also because the Fizz was banned out, so they did acknowledge that they don't want to have yeah. that at all in their hands, especially synergized with how well it was last time. Uh, as we're going to be taking a look here at the bracket for those of you that might, again, be tuning in a little bit late here to the broadcast and entering in to see how the League of Legends teams have gotten to where they were. As you will see from yesterday, what we are referencing to a lot of those types of strategies and compositions, it was where Manhattan versus Fairfield, Manhattan moving in, and then also Niagara falling to Marist ultimately lead us to this grand finals for this MAC Esports Championships. And, you know, again, it's... It's a best of three. It's not a best of five. So everything right now is on the line. They have to be able to take this map away. And I'm really curious if there's going to be this hesitancy that might come out through Manhattan to maybe look for more optimal opportunities to engage, especially with the type of composition that's coming out from Marist. Or they might take a little bit of a chapter out of Marist book and play aggressively to try and find these early advantages to not allow this talent to come online or these other lanes like the Gwen to come online because we've seen how punishing they can be. Yeah, in most situations, I tend to agree with you. I, I, it's one of those situations where your back's against the wall, and instead of trying to play to really take over the game, just play really aggressive, leave it all out there, a lot of teams will just play it 
kind of close to the chest, they will be playing more so to not lose rather than to win, right? I think in most situations, not ideal. Uh, say hi to the cat. The one that keeps yelling at me. <laughs> but it's, it's definitely less than ideal uh, if you are playing in that manner. So I'm interested to see how it's going to pan out. I would really like to see um, a lot more aggression coming out from the side of Marist. I think this is the exact type of composition they want to be doing that in. But if you're Manhattan, you don't need to be playing super aggressive. This is one of those few games where I think playing to not lose might just play out in your favor, especially when you're looking at across the board and you see Talon and Olaf on the enemy team. They don't mm -hmm. tend to scale too well. Agreed. Yeah, and uh, with how Garen and Senna and even Cassiopeia, there's a stack full that will really take advantage later on in this. And it's just whether or not you can play slow, but not allow yourself to be overwhelmed. Like, because you can do that, but if you allow yourself to just be sitting too idly, I can for sure see Marist coming out and saying, all right, if you're going to give us an inch, we're absolutely going to take a mile. Yeah, and I, that's the nature of these compositions where you have the talent, where you have the Olaf. You try to get one or two early kills and you try to just snowball that into like a 20, 25 minute win. All of a sudden it looks insane. It looks unstoppable. But if it falls behind even just a little bit, it can be really tricky to come back in for him. Mm -hmm. And and one of the big things too, I'm going to also kind of just really focus on is how significant you're going to have the Olaf versus the Trundle dynamic because, you know, between the two, the the one to one in the jungle. I mean, I've I've seen a little bit more of like the Xinjiao we've talked about and others that are significant into it. But the Olaf and Trundle dynamic, I still feel like it would lead a little bit more in favor of the Trundle personally, just because of their ability to steal it, depending upon how the you know Ragnarok is available or not. So there's yeah. a couple of different dynamics between the two and how you're going to maybe potentially take it more favorable in Gage. Yeah, and I think a lot of my eyes are going to be focused on the jungle matchup. Uh, the big thing that sticks out to me is Olaf tends to have a much faster clear. The Undertow just does mm -hmm. so much damage. It's a lot of AoE. Trundle it relies on his frozen domain to have an attack speed steroid, and he's all single target focused. So there's not really a ton of clear speed available in comparison. However, Olaf tends to be pretty mana hungry in his early clear. His early skirmishing is insane. I think it's slightly better than Trundles, who also is really, really good in their like level three fights. But I, I'm interested to see exactly how this jungle pathing is going to play out. If these two junglers meet up, it could be a very, very volatile early game. Yeah, I was even just taking a moment since you were talking about it, looking just even at some historical data between the two. And they're about par, like about even uh, when it comes to at least looking at their, you know, counter kill ratios, championship kill ratios. They're within only a small percentage margin between the two of them. So, you know, with that data and looking at that information, it really, I think, comes down to a combination of timing and play style and what they're looking to do, like you mentioned, and how that's going to influence as we are actually going to be heading into game here, we do have this potentially being the final hour for Manhattan. Marist could be able to take the championship and the win for the final game of today. Or is Manhattan going to be able to turn this around with a composition that they feel confident with, play it slow, and manage to take the W? Yeah, very interested to see. Also worth noting, Jason Wood's going to be picking up the Spectral Sickle, locking the Senna for themselves. So this will be the Farming Seraphine, has opted into the Phase Rush for a little more survivability. Uh, you land three abilities of any sort. All of a sudden, you run away really, really fast. Actually helps a lot against especially Ghost, Olaf, and Cobra. Yeah. Oh, First Strike Ignite Talon. This is the definition of I'm jumping at you level 2 and just going to try to one-shot you. Cassia <laughs> really weak early on. I mean, you only have the ability to slither away. You don't have any yeah. feet, friends. I mean... <laughs> and I mean, are you going to start Miasma on Cassio? Like, no. It, it feels no. so bad. You generally want to start that Q or that E. Try to just harass. Try to be able to last hit a little better. Has the exhaust to try to negate some of that level 2, but... If Talon takes it first, which he more than likely will, he has that rake for the early clear. It's just tough. It, it's going to be a really, really hard time for Adarezzo to just stay alive in the first two, three, four levels of this uh, lane phase. And that's also what makes me really see how influential Stefu is going to be if they can continue to maintain presence in this mid lane to prevent that early opportunity for Cobra to take down Adarezzo. As we do look uh, in the top lane, it's going to be, you know, Garen, as per usual, just sustain in lane. 
and, you know, grab CS. It's been a while since I've seen a Garen. I've been watching a lot of just play with it recently, and it's just really, really great to see what it can actually do in engagements. And the ability to just pump out damage in some respects is also quite surprising. Yeah, and I'm also interested to see what kind of Garen build we get. I know a few people right? who swear by the Triforce build, who swear yep. by the, uh, what is it, Triforce, Berserker Greaves, and you just, like, e-spin on people and shred them. <laughs> Some people yeah. really just prefer going into your Stridebreaker Bruiser builds, and uh, I think either is pretty effective. I would lean a little more towards the Bruiser build when you're against, like, an Olaf in particular, but against Gwen, I could totally see the, the argument for wanting to go for the Triforce. Nice opportunity with the lockdown, getting some chip damage in, but great counterplay coming in. Woods actually going to force out the flash from Nate. Very early summoner. And they're going to come out only being able to really you know, not lose too much here in the grand scale of things. Yeah, and that is a really, really big flash to come out in the 2v2. Uh, Ezreal, notoriously slippery with basically two flashes, but will now only have access to one. Stefa was spotted here. And going to look to try and get the pillar. Immunity is still available, and Abel should be able to get out of this scot free. Take a little bit of chip damage here. Nice couple of melees on top. Stefo, though, also punishment a little bit. With minion damage. As uh, Croissant's just going to say, all right, friend, that's cool. I'll just I'll just let you bail, and then I'll get back to doing what I'm doing. Yeah, and I wanted to bring this up as well. We saw this yesterday from Croissant, but opting into the flash on Gwen in the solo lane, this is not something that uh, we see too, too much anymore. Uh, oftentimes, she's more into your TP Ignite or the TP Ghost even. So playing it even safer. So even if Stefo shows, even if there's a kill threat, that flash is available for just a little added safety. Really, really like seeing this, especially especially when you know you are kind of that late game insurance for your team right now. And with how we had the GP play previously, there's a lot of control and understanding of positional awareness. So the flash being more of a safety, or if it needs to look for that critical value onto either the back line or an execution to maybe swing it back into their favor in an engagement that's not as beneficial, there's a lot of value that can be brought with it. And again, like you mentioned, Ghost is just able to close gaps. Typically, you're looking to try and just collapse onto the team with the extra movement speed. Stefo, though, now going to look to potentially push into the middle position. Does get the movement. Pillar still held on to. Nice knockback. Is going to be able to just parkour over. So not really too much worry there for Cobra. Oh, that is the one unfortunate <laughs> thing. Uh, Adorezzo just not really ready with the Miasma. Pretty low in mana as well. But if that comes down, all of a sudden can look pretty rough for Talon. Wouldn't be able to use that Assassin's Path over the Pillar. And that is the unfortunate interaction of Trundle and Talon. Uh, Cobra just able to dash over the pillar. Doesn't really care that he's being slowed. Now he's just created a wall between you two. Uh, looking for a return. Olaf in mid lane. Rando not able to get a couple of axes. Just wants to be there for support. Just saying, all right, friend, I'm here. I've got you. Just going to get some presence to clear this out and potentially look for an opportunity to back or potentially roam into this bottom position. But now as we take a look at the bottom half, which we've not really had too much vision of, there's been some great changing and exchanges coming through to put a little bit more punishment onto the health values of both Woods and Bazan. Yeah, uh, definitely a little interesting to me to see how far away from tower or the enemy tower its bot lane is, but Nate gets tagged up again. Oh, nice lockdown. There's the heal. Is having enough to sustain. Nate goes down wow. first blood into the pocket of Jason. Now, there is some potential re-engagement. Stefo not actually going to look for it. They've acknowledged that Rando Main is present. And we'll just look to take what they can get. Yeah, and in Manhattan's win over Fairfield yesterday, a lot of the strength that came out from Manhattan was through this bottom lane, looking for these 2v2 kills. They ended up finding it here in this game, and this could be very pivotal for what Manhattan looks to do to try and snowball this game. Senna, if she gets ahead... Uh, once you get to that Kraken Slayer, if you opt into that build, of course, it is so much damage, so much range, and she can just pump out uh, all of it without really too, too much threat. Granted, still have a lot of utility, still have a lot of dive coming out from Maris, so they might have enough answers, but actually looks like we're going to see the Eclipse build coming out from Jason Woods this time around. Not against this either. Okay, interesting. There's still a lot of aggressive presence here. Rando main... Oh, they're no. just trying to counter jungle here, and they're going to actually rotate around. They're going to collapse here onto Stefo. Has to use the mobility. Flashes over just at this point, knows that they cannot allow themselves to get capitalized on and will be able to forf that summer spell. 
Yeah, and luckily enough for Manhattan, Ezreal walking back from base, so no real threat of this Drake being taken. Olaf, one of the champs that uh, has been kind of fabled to be this, uh, we're just going to give him the first two Drakes of the game kind of champion. He's mm -hmm. able to take them very, very early on uh, for basically free. It's a very, very strong early clear. Thus far, Manhattan able to shut that down, the 2v2 kill. Preventing, I think, the ideal timing for this Olaf to take that Drake. And now, it actually looks like Manhattan themselves might be looking to secure it. As they rotate down position, you can see if they will look to engage it. Since they have also, you know, at this point, they should be able to recognize that Rando Main is going to move up the top half since they rotated into this bottom position. They dropped their ward. They've managed to clear it out. So there's no real hesitation. And at this point... Free Dragon that they're going to take at this 8-minute marker a little bit later. As you mentioned, the Olaf is pretty quickly able to gain these. But they can pass it over. Not too much here for the first and second Drake, getting a massive value. And uh, there's a lot of pings coming in up top. They know that Rando Main is there, and they're going to try and potentially yeah. get a collapse. Three versus one, too, especially if you've got the talent from Cover moving up. Yeah, and I really like this call from Godsent, just walking away from the tower, especially after some of the, the difficulties that were had on the Darius yesterday with some of those types. Just respecting where the enemy jungler is, where the enemy mid laner can be. Rando going to be taking up this Rift Herald as well. Good response, knowing that Stefo had just taken that Drake bot side and won't really be looking to clear up top anytime soon. So just the trade of neutrals in the long run, but first Drake being taken away from an Olaf is... Definitely a worrying sign for Maris. Hopefully able to gain that Rift Herald so they can start getting some lane cryo. And which one they want to attempt to try and break down, especially since there is still a good few minutes remaining for those plates for the extra gold. Would not be surprised if they funnel it either into the top half or to that middle segment to try and give the value either to Cobra or to Croissant. As we still keep the fixation onto the bottom lane. Two versus two. Nate flank forward again. Is there a chance? Oh, actually, they're going to have a rotation here. Cobra's looking to come in for a flanking position. Might be able to get value onto it underneath the tower. Three versus two. The dive could be coordinated, but there is some easy response from the mid lane. Adarezzo is Talon's looking pinched. to try and ooh, does go over the wall. Using the movement speed, quickly going to get themselves out of it. Evades <laughs> over the pillar and goes once again. This is just an easy escape. Yeah, I mean, Talon was pinched, and then he just jumped over 16 walls and got out of there. Uh, yep. Talon, definitely one of those champs that I think most players are not accustomed to playing against too, too frequently. Uh, very small pool of uh, players who will actually play that champion, of course, but you have to play the game so much differently as a result of him existing. Yeah. If that's any other mid laner, they die there for sure, and I think Cobra, knowing their limits on this champion a little better, knows that they can get away with it. Nate looking for a cheeky little bind. Oh, now there's some big damage that comes through. Nate comes in with just enough mana for the full combo. And is going to punish very quickly this bot lane for Manhattan. Yeah, and we mentioned how big the 2v2 for Manhattan has been in the past. This time around, Maris taking the 2v2 kill, going over to the Lux as well. So, sure, Ezreal doesn't pick it up, but Nate the Great, we saw it both games yesterday. Super strong in the Lux, does so much damage, so much work. Croissant's under pressure here. Oh, forces the flash right as the pillar comes through. Again, using that as the safety net for Croissant to get right back in the lane. They're both going to have to evade, and now they actually go in for a return. The mid lane comes in swiftly on to the trundle play of Stefo, and they make this now a 2-1 to one with a good 1,000 cold, cold K lead. Yeah, really, really big pickup there. The Rift Herald will be dropped as well, just to secure a few more plates. And this is the issue with how Stefo was being punished earlier in this game. We saw three people collapsing onto the Trundle in that bottom jungle earlier. Stefo forced to burn the flash, and this is the result of it. Ends up dying as a really awkward time, I would say. Was looking to try and punish a play, gets the Gwen flash out, walks away, thinks, all right, I'm safe. Talon jumps over the wall, Olaf ghosting at you. All of a sudden, no flash for Stefo. Stefo's gonna fall. Rift Herald pop topside, gets that first turret as well for Maris. And once again, they just seem to be trying to take control of this game. Oh my goodness, we talked about it earlier, already getting the combination from Nate, but this time that was just a clean chase and an overzealous positioning by Josh and punished in the river again. Yeah, and at this point, Lux being two and one, 
the Seraphine, the one that's farming, being down 20 CS, being down 202 as well now. Not where you want to be if you are Baz uh, Baz and Josh, I think. Less than ideal for sure. Ezreal's just shifting Oh! In. Absolutely goes for the True Shot Barrage. Cobra's there just in case if they are needed, but doesn't even have to assist. This is now Maris taking full control of this nice pillar, forces out the flash over the wall, but there is some nice retaliation coming through. This rotation now from the mid laner, getting a lot of damage, able to do so, comes in, locking really down big. that Cobra, so they will be able to have to flee in this can't sustain. Nice job overall, Petrifying Gay is doing so much work here to turn this back in favor of Manhattan. Yeah, unfortunately, Co Cobra will just be able to walk away, and I would have really liked to see Stefo just let that blue buff get secured by Cassio. Seraphine's caught in the pit. Oh no, looking to try and get out. Nice support from the rest of the team to look for the re-engagement. Croissant now getting overwhelmed. The Snip Snip isn't able to do enough damage onto Godsent, and now they've got the Dragon in their sights. There's not enough really to come out on top of this Rando main and wheels down below, looking to potentially see if they want to go in on this, but it's a two versus five, and that's not a favorable advantage. Yeah, Final Spark comes in as well. Won't be enough. Rando not going to go over. Probably the right call, I would say, but... Against an Olaf, not every day you see the first two Drakes being taken by the opposition. Manhattan feeling pretty good about that. Down a kill, down a pretty substantial amount of gold off of that turret take, but... Where the gold is, Cassio is ahead of Talon, which feels really good. Seraphine and Senna super far behind. Yeah, that's to be expected right now. And Garen, even though behind about 600, still feeling pretty alright considering how poorly that lane seems to have gone already. Like... A lot of the shining light right now, I think, for Manhattan is going to be around this Cassio. We didn't even see it, but Cobra just assassinated a Senna. That's, you know, it happens. I mean, pop one, two, three, off yep. screen. <laughs> back and back and back in the back and spawn. In, oh, gosh. And that's the scary thing when it comes to yeah. Cobra on this talent. And again, like you mentioned it, a lot of teams that we would say aren't really too accustomed to seeing it. And because of that, you know, learning curve, getting back into it and being aware of how much potential it can bring, it'd be a scary thought. Yeah. And especially if you're able to generate a lead, it it's just so dirty. Uh, one zero one on the talent. Sure, you're down 30 CS. Your lane opponent's up a decent amount of goal at the foot. It doesn't really matter. You haven't been shut down, <laughs> and that's the big thing. You have this Senna, you have this Seraphine, who are both going to just pop instantly if you breathe on them, especially with the first strike, especially with the Ignite. There's just not yeah. enough survivability for this bottom lane. And now as there's only a few portions of health remaining on this tower, it should go down. True Shot Barrage looking to see if they can continue to harass so that they do get it. Nice land here. Comet comes through as well. So, we're going to now see, once again, this rotation moving up towards that Rift Herald to secure it. Since they've lost both of the dragons, as you commented, hopefully they'll be able to get the second one to see if they can gain value onto another turret. But there's a flank now coming in to... Oh, Adarezzo is going to be in a dangerous position. There's the Olaf jumping over. Ghost is active. Oh. Does actually miss the axe here and goes in with a Ragnarok. Four versus one has to pop the stasis. Stefo is there to give some assistance, but it's far too late as Nate gets another tank down for this bot lane. Yeah, and unfortunately, Adarezzo just stepping a little too far forward. Thought they could get a little cheeky with it. Good ult. I really like this vision. Turn onto the bot lane, try and just stifle any sort of extra damage there. You know you're not going to be CCing the Olaf anyway. But unfortunately, just a little too overaggressive. Stefo trying to step in, trying to keep their mid laner alive. It's not quite enough, and that will be now the second Herald going over to Marist. And they, once again, just taking control Woo! over this game. The 2v2 bot side looked rough early, but, oh, it's just barely going to go wide. Unfortunately, there for wheels, but a really, really good play. Set of plays, rather, coming out from Marist thus far. <laughs> Everything's just being committed. They just want to get rid of Josh. Just go away, Josh. Yeah, I mean... Seraphine, I guess. Um, interested to see what the build's gonna be. Uh, potentially could see something like the Leandries coming out with that lost chapter. Potentially a crown, I guess. I'm not a against the idea of crown, especially when you're against this talent against the Olaf. But against Ezreal and Lux, it feels kind of bad. 
we do see the next Drake going to come up here in a minute and 30 seconds to see if that's something that you can continue to potentially stack into your favor. Again, Manhattan has been able to take these initial two. And this is really the last opportunity that you're going to have Maris be able to forfeit a dragon because it will put them onto a dragon soul. And with the pick potential that they can have, Cobra's going to rotate up through this jungle, attempting to get this mid laner since no the tower way. has been eliminated. Does get sought out, though. Has to go over the wall. There is Stefo to assist. Double jump. There is going to be a big proc of damage, but Adorezzo is going to be able to escape just out of range as Cobra's not done yet. Looking to go over the wall, coming in. Beautiful, petrifying Beautiful. gaze, and will be able to escape. Takes down one, eliminating the mid laner, but is going to still have some assistance from Nate the Great to get a one for one trade. Yeah, really, really well played from this Cassiopeia. Just making sure to get something back. However, the jungler does end up falling 1 3 and 2 now for Stefo on the Trundle. Not where you want to be on this pick at this point in time. The Drake spawning here in 30 seconds. Cloud Drake, so not exactly the most impactful, just solo Drake, of course, but Jason, oh, oh my, my gosh, goodness. already chunked. Yo! Ooh. Forces the flash to get out of there. You've lost that summoner and the heal now for Jason Woods. Doesn't matter if you're on the Ash or the Senna, you're going to be popping those summoners lightning fast. Yeah, and at least this time you're not against the Malphite, so you're not going to get as easily punished for uh, not having those available, but uh, this will just be the Drake now going over first of the game for Marist, and it's a little slower than I think you would want if you are this uh, Olaf Talon composition, but move speed on a Gwen feels really good. There's a reason a lot of people do opt into the Ghost on her, of course, um, and we'll see. If they're able to stack four of those, I mean, this team is just going to be running so, so fast. Yep. Absolutely, and when you get that value, as you can see a rotation down below. Oh, Adorezzo is going to be sought out. They're looking for a potential collapse. Rando main will be able to grab that away, so there's no opportunity of the extra gold, and things kind of slow down a little bit here. Again, the Drake is down. The Baron is not up just yet, and at this point, just trying to hold strong and keep whatever objectives they can, and these turrets, even in the mid lane, is almost about to go down for a second one. Yeah, and it looks like... No objective bounties coming through quite yet for Manhattan, unfortunately. It's tough. They're in a really, really tough spot right now, I think. They're they're playing well around getting this vision control around the top side, trying to make sure there's no risk at an early Baron. We see a lot of control around this river, but unfortunately, Croissant, sure, 0 one zero, only up about 10 CS. It's still Gwen. They, like, this champion does so much work as the game progresses, especially into this double bruiser type composition, Garen opting into the stride breaker, so we'll have a little extra utility, a little more lockdown potential as a result, but it's still tough. Cobra might be caught. Ooh, Cobra getting a little overzealous here, looking for that vision. We'll be able to escape as per usual. It has to be cautious. They don't want to find themselves getting caught out as we've seen prior and being easily punished. Yeah, and this is one of the beauties of having the Talon for the mid laner is generally, especially after having the Ghost Blade, just really, really fast, right? You're able to walk up, try and scout out some vision, potentially put a ward down, sweep a ward out, sure, whatever, and then just jump over a wall. Uh, Assassin's Path is a pretty good mobility spell when you're able to utilize it. When you're next to walls, when you're fighting in these jungle corridors, it just gives you so much survivability, so much self peel as well. And uh, Stefo just getting abused Whoa! by Ezreal. Getting chunked. True Shop Barrage comes out there just to see if they can maybe get the numbers advantage. Stefo has to play super careful when looking to try and get close to wheels again because they really have been pumping out significant damage and their throughput is unbelievable. Oh my gosh. Even oh the no, he gets it. Now with a stack there, gets a second! Nate the Great comes in for the layup! Oh my goodness, what a dominant play right now. And all the while in top lane, Croissant Bandit is just having a free-for-all in this second tower. Yeah, there's not really a response. This is the one issue that I see with Manhattan's composition right now is they have really good counter engage with the Cassia, with the Seraphino as well. But their engage is just the Seraphino. It's just that, or maybe yeah. you happen to land a Senna W, right? All these fights are being taken on Maris' terms. They're executing beautifully, and there's not a punish that Manhattan can make for that split push for any sort of over-aggression or overstep. 
and Wheels is just popping off with the Ezreal. Two gorgeous Mystic shots being weaved through that fight, picking up two kills themselves, and oh my gosh, it's it just looks rough right now for Manhattan. I mean, they need to... It, it's so hard because you commented on it. The Mystic shots have been on point, and Wheels has been so elusive. But saying elusive just to Wheels is an understatement because now yes. if you try and focus on to Wheels, then you've got Cobra. If you try to focus down Cobra, you've got Wheels. It's just this, who do you choose to take the advantage of and whether or not the uh, alternative is going to be vastly worse. <laughs> Yeah, and even if you somehow manage to pick one of them off, or even both of them off, you still have to worry about the Gwen and the Olaf yeah. who are just going to be running at your backline. This Senna, this Seraphine, they're not going to be able to live against that in most cases, even with the exhaust for one of them. But Gwen's got a lot of true damage packed into her kit, so not too sure that would end too, too well. And if all else fails, you still have the Lux. Lucent Singularity does so much damage, Light Binding, so much utility, Final Spark, a ton of damage as well. Godsend just finds a wild talon roaming through his jungle, knows there's literally nothing that can be done about it, and this jungle belongs entirely to Marist. Oh my goodness, Jason's all oh, on tap L. Here's the follow through. Big opportunity though, gets the shutdown. That's something of value, but in the back line, you're going to have the snip snip come through. Needleworks as well will be committed. And as I say that, despite it looking like it was originally going to be Marist, there is a, the ability to persevere through from Manhattan and come out on top. Oh. Oh, unfortunately, no ultimate available for the Ezreal, that Mystic Shot, just doing so much damage. But regardless of the fight turning out in favor of Manhattan, this does give priority to Marist for the Drake. The health bar is just a little too low from the side of Manhattan, and it just looked rough. Like, Josh finds a gorgeous Seraphine ult to start with, and yeah. it looks tough. Nate just, like, flashes into a wall, walks back into the ult, nothing that can be done there. But... With the Lux dead, it looks like that might be the fight for Manhattan. They take the fight, but it's just a little uncoordinated towards the end of it. The Olaf able to run down. Cassio flashing in with the ultimate as well, finding the stun onto three, doing so much oh, work. Oh no. Just got and two that's, tapped. That's the issue. Ezreal is so strong right now. 404 has the Prowlers completed, um, which is a build that's been popping up in popularity as of late. Just a lot of extra damage, a lot of lethality against this yeah. triple squishy composition. Uh, not the end of the world. The active is not so much the uh, the shining light of it. Definitely more on the mythic passive. The amount of damage it provides. And Baron started up here. Oh no. It's caught out. True Champarage comes through and continues to just harass out of Rezo, they can't look for this engagement and they have to forfeit this Baron. And now you're gonna look to see the separation forcing in these lanes, most likely gonna try and pressure that bot lane too so that they can get dominance or even look to try and just shift into one specific lane to open up these inhibitors, either in the mid lane or the top lane. Yeah, I, I just, I'm trying to think of what the condition is for Manhattan to come back into this one. I think that fight that they just had around that fourth Drake was probably the closest they're going to get to an ideal fight for their team. You have a lot of counter gauge. You have to just rely on somehow, some way, being able to burn down the Talon, being able to just kite out the Gwen. It still feels rough if you're looking for that full team fight. And even in your split push, Gwen at this point, I don't think cares too, too much about the Garen. Sure, he's 3-0. Sure, he's on two items, but he's mostly built to try and deal with AD threats, not from yeah. this true damage, not from the magic damage that Gwen is going to be providing either. And Croissant should just be able to have a field day from this point on. Yeah, had it already in the top lane and now going to do the same in the bot lane. That outer turret, well, second outer turret is going to be going down. There is a potential opportunity to maybe harass it, but they can't risk it. There's this two position jungle from both Nate and also the quick movement here from Cobra. They're actually already into the base. They're aggressively playing. Health values are low. The pillar comes in onto Cobra. Does have to force him over the oh. wall. Great take. Gets the second. This is an opportunity again for Manhattan. They're exploiting this overzealous play and allowing themselves to take these fights more favorably, even though they're down this almost 10k gold they're finding really great exchanges yeah that almost seemed rough initially for manhattan i think josh just not being able to find any targets with the ultimate but 
I didn't quite get to catch what had happened for that play to start. Both of the major carries, though, for Marist have been shut down in that fight, and the shutdown's going into pretty big places. I believe one went to the Senna, which really that gold is necessary for this champion to really come online especially with this eclipse build opting into a a little less sustained damage right you're looking more at trying to auto queue somebody and that does a decent chunk of damage as opposed to the kraken slayer builds where you're a lot more focused on that damage over time that team fight focused damage so getting more gold into her pocket will feel pretty good interested to I see mean, what that'll do Speaking of just the goal, I mean, you're looking at 12k right now for the Ezreal. If you could just continue to try and yeah. shut that down, because that just shows how economically ahead they are, in addition to what they've just been able to find, period, with their play. Yeah, and I think there's definitely a decent point to be made uh, as Cobra. Yeah, it doesn't want to fight Garen, I promise you that right now. Um, <laughs> although, yeah, Godson being uh, that hurts. out here. Yeah, that hurts. <laughs> and that was three points. Yeah. As you can see, still some slow momentum here. Some pokes over the wall. This is this is just a, it's a gentleman's quarrel right now between yeah. the two. Just saying, we're gonna we're gonna wait to see what's gonna happen. Look for the fight. And I mean, Maris. Oh Ooh. my, Woods, you have such a lucky break. Survive that one. <laughs> Yeah, Jason, though, forced into a weird spot where no matter what you do, it's going to end poorly. Had to either walk through the Luxie and take a bunch of damage on the out or stand in place and take a da bunch of damage trying to get out um, after the fact. So, unfortunate. Has the healing, oh, but it's not no. going to matter. And again, it's this just constant poke that's going to come out from both wheels and Nate. You don't even need... Cobra's just there waiting in the wings if they find an opportunity to collapse onto somebody. And all the while that they're keeping them at bay here, this is just going to be a third Drake going in favor of Maris, continuing to stack that mobility. And as you commented very early with these Drakes when we had the first acknowledgement of the Dragon Soul, they are just going to be weaving through this map. Yeah, the move speed might be a little too much. Double root! Oh! Can they collapse onto it? Nice follow-up going in big. Lockdown comes on to two, but there's an ultimate in exchange. The heal from the backside is not going to be enough from Woods. Jason, with a hope and a dream to keep his team alive, can't manage to persevere. Cobra escapes with the skin of their teeth, and Wheels gets a double. Oh, the flash oh, forward. Flash forward. Wheels is going to get locked down in the back. Is there anybody close enough? They get it. Josh gets the elimination. Now the refocus onto the mid laner. Can't get the takedown. Rando main eliminated. And once again, Manhattan plays this so beautifully despite the disadvantages. Yeah, Josh just finding a gorgeous route onto two members, onto both of the carries for Maris, onto the Ezreal, onto the Lux, following it up with that Encore, just doing so much work. And sure, Ezreal gets to shift away, but still ends up getting tagged by that ult regardless. Oh, uh, Josh no. is just dead. Cobra, you're dirty. You're just dirty. We're just going to watch it come to fruition. Easy, easy pickup here. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Chris Saw, I was waiting for Chris Saw to actually take it. <laughs> you just see Chris yeah. Saw steal it away from Cobra. For sure. Definitely, uh,. Kind of expected that. If that's solo queue, that Gwen is like flashing to secure that kill every time, of course. Uh, but, of course, organized play, you want that gold to just go where it probably should. Gwen, 1 2 and 2, not necessarily the prettiest scoreline, but uh, definitely feeling pretty solid. Has the core two items and the hourglass on top of it. So, just so much utility, basically, for this champion. As we can see, the gold bounties have been online here for Manhattan because it is roughly about 10k floating between the 8 and 10k marker. Aaron has come back online and a point of focus here for Marist since they have been warding and keeping an eye on it, still playing very far forward. They're looking for a favorable fight or a potential pickup by wheels to then transition to the Baron to get a better opportunity. It does evade the crown control. I'm really concerned. Oh my goodness. Nice, nice, happy, well, happy tail. Not happy feet, happy I, tail from, from I the guess. mid laner. Okay, we'll, we'll, well yeah, let that one. That's, that's why she can't buy boots, right? Like, that was the lore yeah. reason. I, 
but Nami still can because she wears them as a hat, something like that. Yeah. Regardless, I love it. <laughs> objective bounty secured in the mid lane, uh, which will be a little more gold going over to uh, Manhattan. However, they do lose another turret in their base as a result, and that will be the trigger for the Baron to be started. Talon distracting too. Yeah, looks like they will just. Honestly, pop the ultimate to evade, drawing them away. Numbers advantage, as you mentioned, the Baron, they'll be able to pick it up. Cobra with the movement speed, and the parkour is able to potentially get to a flanking position if they want to re-engage this from it. He's going in, he's got the vision. They know. You have recognition, beautiful silence, though. Cobra able to just get over the wall. They're committing quite a bit of this. The Blast Cone actually not going to be procced since they're attempting to just chase it down. No other walls available. Cobra's eliminated. There comes the sword from on high. Yeah, God sent 7, 1, and 0 onto this Garen. I was a little interested to see it locked in so early. I didn't think it would be this potent a pick, but doing tons of work on the champion. It's looking like this is definitely a, a big window for Manhattan to try and force us into that game three. Between the Garen damage, the setup from the Seraphine, the setup and damage from the Cassiopeia, th that's pretty much where I think Manhattan's relying. You mentioned earlier, basically been sitting around an eight to 10,000 gold deficit, but the fight's breaking out. Does get locked behind the pillar. Stefo is gonna just evade that true shot barrage. The dragon up in 45 seconds. This is Dragon Soul for Maris. They've got the Gwen positioning up top, still having the TP available if necessary. A lot of pokes still coming through, prepping for this Drake. This is a really difficult position to be in because you don't have the TP from Godspend, oh, so this no. can continue to harass. Nice evasion and eludes the damage, but this is still a scary position to be in. Yeah, Gwen's still pushing up the top side as well. Took the first inhibitor for their team. And the 4v4 round Drake, so much poke from this Lux, from this Ezreal. Cobra looking for the flank as well, looking for oh, no. his time to shine, and he's going. Oh no, but gonna get flanked! That is Cobra coming in with a venomous bite in the back. Now going for Steppo as they're dividing the two. The Gwen attempting to collapse from this bottom position to give the assistance. Petrifying gaze, but there's nobody here for damage. It's a snake that's left alone and is just completely having to burrow their way back to spawn. Steffo will be able to escape out of there. Croissant gets the stasis to survive. And now with the Baron buff, and there's such a lengthy timer, this is going to be it. It's only Steffo holding back against Marist, but Marist is in such a dominant position to close this out. They have not allowed it to go to a game three. They will take the trophy, the title, and the glory that goes along with this in this map esports championships. Let's give a huge round of applause for them taking the W. Back-to-back -back wins and not once dropping a game over the course of this entire season. Yeah, really dominant showing coming out, especially today, but across the games yesterday as well, Manhattan just doing a ton of work, playing extremely well over the course of all four games over the past two days, and especially in this one. Oh my lord, that talent was disgusting. The Lux Binds, the pickups, so much work. And even if the 2v2 didn't look like it was going to go too well, that first blood for Manhattan, just so, so strong. I thought that was going to be where Manhattan would come fully online. Maris just managed to turn it around. Really, like, they lost the first Drake, sure. They lost the second Drake, sure. They lost the first blood bot lane, but who cares? Oh Lux just my. finding so much over the course of that mid game. I mean, this is the snapshot of the final game for this season. What a tremendous play. Major credit though to Manhattan in uh, several significant fights for them to try and turn this around. You can't count them out for what they were able to gain, but overall Marist, yes, able to just perform at such a, there's the cat, there it is. Towards the end, that's the celebration. The trophy, the glory, the, the surprising victory here for Marist and cats. <laughs> yeah, I don't can't, think can't have a celebration would, without a cat. <laughs> I don't think our producer would be happy if I didn't bring him on screen at some point uh, outside know, right? of the the window camera feed. But yeah, very <laughs> strong showing coming out, I think, from Maris. They just, even in this game, there were a few instances where it looked a little sloppy. It looked a little wishy washy, but their comp just basically was we're going to keep running at you and make it work somehow, some way. Uh, Wheels on the Ezreal doing so much work. I mean, we saw all the poke that came out yeah. earlier. 
like, two Mystic shots, basically one shot a Seraphine, one shot the Senna as well. And even though Baze and Josh had a few really good angles, yeah, too. like that. Yeah, there it is. Like, this ridiculous. is ridiculous. And then the follow up from Nate, basically the bot lane just poking and gaining significant value outright. As we're actually going to be able to get a quick camera shot here of the 2022 MAC Esports League of Legends Championship trophy. What a well deserved, victorious token for them to hold on to. And even some kind handshakes here as well for those championship shirts coming out. Look at the. I, I want one of those. If only I was that good of a gamer. <laughs> Yeah, for real. Even yeah, there it is. It. Yeah, yes. love to see it. Knowing <laughs> <laughs> major, major compliments and congratulations here to Maris, who has been able to take it. The entire team stacking up probably for some amazing photos to be able to be kept in legacy moving forward for this 2022 year. And I mean, honestly, we talked about it. We had stellar gameplay coming out from the League of Legends. We had it from our other game titles earlier. It's just overall been a spectacular day for this Mace Esports Championship as we take one last look here at the bracket, how it all went down and how we found ourselves in these final moments with Maris taking this championship over Manhattan and just what, what an applause to be had for all of them. Yeah. Very, very strong showing coming out tonight. Uh, very happy with the results, I think, is Maris. They won Overwatch right before this. They come in, they take yep. the 2-0 sweep in League of Legends as well. So very strong showing all around. And I think there's also definitely points that can be held high for Manhattan. I think they had a really strong showing, especially toward the end of that second game. But ultimately, Maris does come away with the trophy today. And I have to say, it's been an absolute pleasure being alongside you, my friend. It, we've not had the chance to really be side by side as much, but it's a great opportunity as we also do want to give a huge shout out to our amazing sponsor, Showboat Hotel in Atlantic City, who's been one to really give great, great support and just foundation to bringing this type of weekend to you. Again, this three-day weekend has been an amazing opportunity to feature these students, allow them to perform and demonstrate how valuable this esports scene is. And I mean, overall, when it does come to what we've had today from those, the, the, the broadcast in and of itself have been amazing. And we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. We conclude with another championship going in favor of Maris. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your night. Take care. Happy gaming. And we will look to see you next time, friends.